it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, the first one of the day, Dr. Ron Stensvold from Denmark, and he will talk about blastocystes, updates on detection, subtypes, host specificity, and associations to microbiota signature. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And, um, I hope you had a good rest and um, ready to take in some more information about blastocystis. Uh, we are having a small issue up here, uh, but uh, I think we will launch our pres my presentation. Oh, it's coming. Yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, so in the meantime, I can say that, uh, or repeat that, I, I started working with this parasite um, 13 years ago. Uh, and it's just such a great pleasure for me that we can have conferences on blastocystis now. The first one in 2015, thanks to Funda, and now we're having this one in 2018. So um, it's a dream come true, and um, um, it's been a, a field that has been rapidly evolving. And one of my first slides, uh, actually, I can show it now. Oh, yes! <laughs> Thank you. The first slide is the vacuolar form that you might uh, know from your cultures. If you don't culture, please do. This is one of the parasites that can be cultured. Uh, and it's actually a very nice activity. If I had all the money in the world and all the time in the world, I would spend most of it with uh, my cultures, I think. <coughs> I'm not even joking. <coughs> because uh, there is so much you can do. And also for students, <coughs> this is a very nice uh, way to learn about parasitology, parasitological methods, both the basic ones, but also the DNA-based uh, one. <coughs> So, this is what it looks like in, uh, in Jones medium, the image to the left. And my impression by now is that blastocystis is lodged in the distal ilium, in the circum and the proximal, proximal uh, colon. That's where it sits. I believe that one billion people, or maybe even more, are colonized by this parasite. It's typically a chronic infection or colonization we can't distinguish we have no cure there is no drug that can actually consistently eradicate blastocystis um, so we are in the dark in a lot of areas still <clears throat> but knowledge is really piling up now we know that blastocystis is not even remotely related to any of the parasites that we uh, otherwise know. It's not related to Jarja, Intermeba, Cryptosporidium, the other uh, protozoa that we know so well. No, it's uh, in the group of Straminopyles, and it's, uh, for instance, it's uh, related genetically to Phytophthora, also known as the cause of potato blight. So what on earth is this organism doing in our intestine? We we only know one other genus of Streminopyles that parasitizes on humans. That one is Phytophthora, and it can cause skin disease. I think it's uh, been found on a couple of occasions in Southeast Asia. So you all know that blastocystis can take on a lot of different forms, especially in the culture, but we also know that morphologically indistinguishable strains exhibit extensive genetic diversity. And by now, oh, thank you. By now, today, we know of about 17 subtypes found in humans, other mammals, and birds. And it's very important for me to say today also that subtypes are probably equal to species or maybe even genera. We don't know for sure now, but it's, the subtype is not a genotype. I, th I know that some people might confuse subtype and genotypes, but for blastocystis, subtype is more of a species, it's not a genotype, because we, we have something within the subtypes that we call alleles that can also be interpreted as genotypes. And we also know that there is a large variation in global prevalence and distribution of subtypes, and I'll show you that later. So the subtype system is applicable to mammalian and avian blastocystis. And most non-bird, non-mammal blastocystis have their own species names, or at least do not cluster with bird and mammal subtypes. So when is a strain a new subtype? Um, 
this is really important to have some agreement on this because otherwise we can end up in a situation uh, similar to the one that we had uh, some years ago where we had where we all had our own terminologies so i uh, and other people uh, recommend that uh, we need 80% uh, or more of the small subunit rRNA gene and that sequence has to differ by 5% or more to be considered a potentially new subtypes, a new subtype. So that's recommendation for now. Some of the acknowledged subtypes, for instance, subtype 6 and subtypes 9, subtype 9 differ by less than 5%. However, sampling has been sufficient to separate these two lineages based on host specificity. So the 5% divergence has been chosen as quite a stringent uh, criterion, and more data may lead to the revision of new subtype definitions in the future. So please just try and have this in mind because it's very likely that you will find sequences that you think, oh God, this must be a new subtype. But please have this in mind and try and sequence the entire small subunit RNA gene if you suspect that you might have a new subtype. Okay, so observations on subtype distributions in surveys keep piling up and that's a really, really good thing because that enables us to see something like this. We have here 2,022 observation from the non-Europe part of the world and here we have 1,149 observations from Europe. And this is the subtypes that we see and you can clearly see one major difference. The one being that subtype 4 is quite common in Europe but not common outside of Europe. In Europe, it accounts for almost a fourth of the subtypes seen in humans, which is very interesting. Subtype 4 does not have nearly the same amount of genetic diversity that most other subtypes have. It's almost clonal, which could indicate that this subtype entered the human population recently compared to the other ones. Subtype 1, 2, 3, and 4 accounts for more than 90% of all human subtype carriage. Moving on to host specificity, this is something I find very interesting. We know now that, as I said, the yellow represents those subtypes that predominate within these groups. So in humans, it's 1, 2, one, two 3, and 4. In non-human primates, it's 1, 2, 3, not really four, but five, especially in apes, and eight. And then you see subtype nine, I have to stress that. We've only seen it a couple of times in humans, um, but we don't have any animal reservoir for that one. So that is really an interesting subtype because we see it so rarely. Why? Um, artiodactyls. Well, a lot of subtypes have been reported, and, and also more than this. This has not been updated recently, sorry for that, but it gives you some indication. 1, 5, and especially 10 and 14, you'll see that all over the world. Even in Greenland, we recently sampled musk, oxen, and sheep in Greenland, and most of these animals were colonized, and they also had uh, 10 and uh, 14. Now, moving on to carnivores, there hasn't been so much sampling done, but they are not very uh, uh, often colonized, and you'll see that in a while, and the subtypes are all over the place, and the same for the marsupials. Birds, however, they have been sampled to some extent, and the subtypes that we see there are typically six and seven. And then the rodents, we have uh, subtype four there. So I want to uh, expand a little bit on the rodents. So Yoshikawa has a nice study from Indonesia where they sampled uh, rats, and nine rats were positive and all had subtype four. There was another Indonesian and Japanese uh, study uh, looking at 115 wild rat samples with uh, 23 sequences obtained, all of them being subtype 4. Juan David has a study as well uh, on uh, 10 rat samples where three were positive, but they were subtype 2. And uh, there was a, a study from Seuss in France where 14 rodent samples were tested and four were positive with subtype 2, subtype 4 and subtype 5. 
And then we had this massive sampling of brown rats, 290 brown rat samples. 46% were, were positive, predominantly subtype 4. In this study, they also tested shrews, which are insectivores, and they had no uh, blastocystis, but they only tested three. And uh, Graham Clark and myself, we tested a capybara uh, not long ago, and it had subtype 3. So quite a few surveys have identified subtype 4 in rats, but rodents may also, uh, rats may also have other subtypes. And rats can be colonized by human isolates, for instance, subtype 1, as recently shown by my colleague in uh, the Czech Republic. Um, I'll show you that later. But could rats be reservoir host for human subtype 4 carriage seen so often in Europe? Um, but if so, if seen in Asian wild rats, why is subtype 4 so rarely reported in humans in Asia? So there are some questions here that we need some um, answers for. Now moving on to carnivores, I would like to just, I'm not going to go through all of this. You can look yourselves, if you look up the literature, this is something that I find really interesting. You will hardly find blastocystis in carnivores, especially in strictly carnivores. Uh, and when you do find uh, blastocystis, you find uh, a random uh, representation of uh, subtypes. So carnivores may be accidental hosts of blastocystis based on the scarcity and random distribution of subtypes encountered. They may be paratenic host. Maybe the subtypes you see in those hosts may stem from the prey that they eat. So I was wondering lately whether there could be a connection between the presence of a cecum and colonization by blastocystis. Uh, because we know that some uh, animals have a large cecum, for instance, the lagomorphs, uh, some of the ruminants have a large cecum. Uh, foxes, uh, carnivores such as the fox, have a, have a small cecum. And the shrew, for instance, insectivores, they have no cecum at all. Uh, carnivores have short digestive tracts as nutrients in meat are absorbed quicker than those in plant material and they may, may or may not have a cecum and it will only be small in size as their diet consists of very little plant material. On the other hand, herbivores have long digestive tracts as it takes time to absorb nutrients from plant material. They also have a cecum, which helps along with the enzymes to break down plant material and cellulose into short-chain fatty acids. Now, this is something, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but this is something that just came into my mind recently because I was thinking that the likelihood of being colonized by blastocystis might reflect your diet. You know, that's something that I've, has been on my mind lately. And, Maybe it all boils down to your uh, gut physiology, your gut anatomy. Maybe you can actually predict whether a host or a host group are likely to be infected or colonized by blastocystis. I would very much like uh, some of you to think more about that. Okay, going back to the uh, host specificity here with some subtypes, you can see these are uh, primates. So we got the hominids over here and we got the apes here and then we have monkeys and lemurs. Uh, so again, for the hominids one, two, three and four, the apes almost the same but five instead of four. And old world monkeys typically have one, two and three as long as we are in, uh, yeah, in Africa and Asia, of course. And uh, the new world monkeys will have subtype eight to quite a large extent. The lemurs are not very often infected and they have about everything, so maybe they are not natural hosts. Moving on to this allele thing, we know for a subtype three, we have cryptic host specificity. So we sampled uh, humans and non-human primates and we looked at the subtype three sequences on allele level. <clears throat> so this is a, a way of genotyping subtype three. So we know that in humans we have a predominance of allele number 34 and then we have a very random and scarce distribution of other alleles. But for the non-human primates you will see some 34 but not very many and then you will see quite a lot of other alleles uh, there. So this tells me that the strains from subtype 3 infecting non-human primates are actually to a large extent uh, different from those colonizing humans. 
So, uh, how to diagnose blastocystis? Well, in my opinion, and because I had the opportunity, I have been working mostly with uh, uh, DNA-based methods, and I would say, forget about microscopy, at least the regular formal ether concentration technique, because it's very insensitive. It has a sensitivity of 50% or so, maybe even less. Real-time PCR, on the other hand, enables a yes or no answer, and subtyping can be done on positive samples by barcoding of nuclear small subunit ribosomal genes. I'm so pleased to see in PubMed the amount of papers now using this barcoding method, because as Funda has uh, told us so many times, we need standardization of methods. Only by using the same methods we can compare data across borders. And if there is something that we need for blastocystis, this is it. Because blastocystis is all over the world. It's here in Colombia, it's in Denmark, it's in Greenland, it's everywhere. Uh, so for that purpose, I also developed this um, online database uh, that is easily accessible and uh, you can uh, test your FASTA files that you obtain by barcoding on that site. And there is a YouTube video uh, as well. If you look up uh, blastocystis on YouTube, you'll find it. Recently in our lab, we have uh, applied a microbiome platform, as we call it. So we use a 16S primer pair combined with three uh, eukaryotic primer pairs and we uh, put our PCR product on an Illumina sequencing platform, and then we have automated annotation of sequence data to taxonomic level by Bion, which is a newly designed, publicly available software. I'm not gonna uh, tell more about that now. If you're interested, you can always uh, contact me and we can talk about this. Uh, but it's a nice uh, thing for us to use on fecal samples because it's really, really good at detecting and differentiating blastocystis. We get the subtype just there. So um, no, no uh, use to even query the sequences. And it's also very good for amoebozoa. If you're interested in intamoeba or iota amoeba or endolimax, it's very good for that as well. On the other hand, it's not really good for Georgia and diantamoeba, and we are trying to improve that. Prevalence-wise, if you go to Africa, if you use real-time PCR, you will see that blastocystis is, is almost an obligate finding. Actually, in Senegal, the French team identified a prevalence in the children of 100%. We did a similar study with samples from Nigeria, Nigerian children. The prevalence was 84% based on real-time PCR observation. Uh, we have this age distribution, so you can see there is a gradual or relatively quick increase. So when the children reach about four or five years of age, they reach this plateau with this almost 100% um, uh, prevalence. Also, you don't really have to go to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to get a high prevalence. You get a high prevalence in Ireland as well. Uh, Pauline Scanlan who was also very interested in this conference, she showed uh, that 56% of the adult healthy population was uh, positive, and she was also able to detect a temporal stability with colonization going on for at least 6 to 10 years. How about that? Now, blastocystis has been linked to IBS by a lot of groups, and a lot of groups have tried to identify an association with blastocystis and IBS. So in Denmark, we have a prevalence of IBS of 16%, so it's actually quite a common condition in Denmark. And so we set out to detect if those who had IBS had a higher colonization rate of blastocystis and also diantamoeba, which is a very common parasite in Denmark. So what we did was that we had uh, 483 individuals enrolled, and uh, 186 of these were uh, having IBS defined by the Rome 3 criteria, and 297 were healthy controls. And we did parasitological examination by real-time PCR for blastocystis, diantamoeba, entamoeba, and cryptosporidium and jarja. And I know this is maybe difficult for you to see down there at the back, but the red columns here are healthy individuals and the blue ones are IBS. And here it says any parasite, 
blastocystis, dyance amoeba, both blastocystis and dyance amoeba, and amoeba coli and more coli and more than one parasite. And you can see for all of them, they you have a higher prevalence in the IBS patients than in the uh, asymptomatic controls. Um, and also, there was actually the, 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 the relative distribution of blastocystis was non significant between the groups, but for both, if you had both defragilis and, and blastocystis, it was significant. And also for defragilis, defragilis was actually significantly more prevalent in the healthy individuals than in uh, IBS. Moving on to inflammatory bowel disease, I think there are about 12,000 people in Denmark who have inflammatory bowel disease, and you know it can be divided into uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. We had a small study here um, where we saw that 14% uh, of the controls were blastocystis positive and only 4% of the IBD uh, patients were positive. And those IBD patients that were positive, they had inactive ulcerative colitis. They had ulcerative colitis in remission. None of the patients with Crohn's disease had blastocystis. So, I'm very interested in mapping the eukaryome. Most gut microbiome research has focused on prokaryotic diversity, but we have also gained significant insight into the micro eukaryotic diversity of the human gut. And Pauline Scanlan, whom I mentioned before, was actually one of the first to produce papers on this. If you go back to 2008 in the ISMA journal, you'll find a very nice paper by uh, her on uh, the eukaryome or yeah, what you can call it. So, of course, DNA-based methods have been instrumental to this advancement. We started out by conventional PCR and Sanger sequencing, then targeted real-time PCR methods, and now we use metagenomics and amplicon-based uh, next-generation sequencing. So, these are, you're familiar with all of these, I might even have forgot some, but there are a lot of unicellular uh, organisms in our guts, um, and I have sort of try to sort of come up with a new way of thinking because uh, many of these parasites, after we have applied DNA-based methods, we have come to realize that these parasites are very, very common. Hey, blastocystis, 100% in Senegalese children, diantamoeba, almost 100% in Danish children, I haven't shown you, but practically all Danish children in kindergartens have, blast have diantamoeba. Hey, it's related to Georgia. In Entamoeba coli, there was a 38% uh, prevalence in Sulawesi villages. Iod amoeba, 16% uh, in uh, the Philippines. And Endolimax, 29% in Rio. And if you go to the NCBI database, how many sequences do you find on Iod amoeba and Endolimax? Hardly any. I think there is one complete ribosomal gene for Endolimax, and maybe two for Iodamoeba that I produced. So, isn't it strange? You've got all this eukaryotic diversity going on, and there is so little focus on it. Please, help us. <laughs> okay, so, this is a very hot topic, the gut microbiome. And for instance, what, one of the things we know is that in adults, a low diversity microbiota is dominated by facultative anaerobes, is linked to diseases such as acute diarrhea, inflammatory bowel disease, Clostridium difficile infection, metabolic syndrome, and liver disease, just to mention a couple of conditions. Those organisms include, for instance, Escherichia coli and yeasts such as Saccharomyces. Conversely, Gut healthy individuals typically have high microbiota diversity dominated by obligate anaerobes. Those ones being, for instance, Fecalibacterium and Acamansia, etc. We are starting to get a lot of information on this now. But as you also know, gut microbiota also consists of parasites, fungi, archaea, phages, viruses, and so on and so on. So, I think it would be reasonable to ask, is the high gut microbiota diversity linked to gut health represented across taxonomic kingdoms? And to this end, 
is it possible that the potential dysbiosis accompanying or causing organic and functional bowel disorders could prevent blastocystis from establishing in the intestine? Is that the reason why we don't really see this organism in IBS and IBD patients? So some years ago, we set out to uh, look into a meta-hit metagenomics data set. Uh, there was a study published in Nature by Arumogam and colleagues, and we could inherit their data. It was a quite controversial paper, but also a very stimulating paper, because they could stratify their study individuals from Denmark and Spain into enterotypes, mainly three enterotypes, the Bacteroides enterotype, Ruminococcus and Prevotella, enterotypes. These were healthy individuals, there were people with diabetes, people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and so on. So my PhD student developed uh, some blastocystis specific markers and looked into this metagenomics data set to see who were positive for blastocystis and who were not. And when we looked into the different enterotypes we saw that among the Prevotella people and the ruminococcus people, we had quite a fair prevalence of blastocystis, but in those who had a microbiota predominated by bacteroides, we only had one case. So, next question here, does blastocystis select for certain microbes, or do certain microbes select for blastocystis? That is one of the central questions for me. Um, also, across the clinical phenotypes, we saw that there was a fair prevalence among the healthy individuals. Even among those with ulcerative colitis, we had some cases. But among the uh, patients with uh, Crohn's disease, we had no positives. And also, when we looked at BMI, when we looked at the entire data set, there was a trend towards blastocystis being linked to low BMI, but it was non-significant. But if we took out, we were really fishing here, if we took out the Danish cohort, consisting of 177 uh, individuals, we saw a, a very nice uh, statistical correlation between having blastocystis and having a low BMI. And last year, our Italian colleagues, Beghini, they did a meta-analysis of 12 metagenomics data sets, and they were able to find on a general or uh, scale that uh, a low BMI was linked to blastocystis colonization. I urge you to look up this paper. It's very stimulating and in interesting. So going back to our own IBS study, um, Laura set out to look up the top 10 most common genera bacterial genera in those who had parasites and those who had not. And I know you probably can't see, but I'll tell you. The green color is parasite negative individual and the red means that you have a parasite. And then we have all those 10 uh, top common, most common uh, bacterial general, uh, genera here. And you see some islands where you have almost a green color here almost, it's almost exclusively green, so this means that these individuals do not have parasites. And these individuals are dominated by a lot of turquoise, which is, not surprisingly, bacteroides. And also what is more is the fact that those who have this large amount of bacteroides, they have very little diversity, because the higher the column, the lower the diversity, because most of that is actually explained only by 10 bacterial genera. We are not the only ones who have found associations between parasite colonization and uh, certain microbiota signatures. We did a review this year in trends in parasitology, Mark van der Giesen and I, and we looked up the studies that had investigated this, and you can't read it. But I'm just saying that the, the studies use different methods, metagenomics, real-time PCR, metagenomics, applicant-based, next-generation sequencing, etc. And we were looking, or the people were looking at blastocystis mostly, but also entamoeba and jarja, here's entamoeba as well. Jarja was the only parasite in these studies linked to dysbiosis. In all the other studies, we practically saw 
either high diversity, high richness, uh, we saw a predominance of some of the good bacteria, etc., etc. Isn't that interesting? Across the world now, we see these independent observations. Um, and to this end, um, we have three studies now from our group uh, finding that a low gut microbiota diversity plus a high relative abundance of bacteroides leaves little chance of colonization by blastocystis and dientamoeba. Uh, and I, I want to move on to this down here uh, where entamoeba colonization could be predicted with 79% accuracy in rural Africans based on microbiota composition. Just by looking at the composition of the microbiota, you can tell whether a person has parasites or not, at least these guys that we are looking at here. Whew. But is it cause or is it effect? Hmm? So, the, all these clips, what can they tell us about the health status of people? And also, something that I find very interesting, FMT, fecal microbiota transplantation. We are involved in screening of donors for FMT. And in Europe, there is a consensus that blastocystis cannot be present in stool, from donors for FMT. In our lab, we find a lot of blastocystis. And actually, those donors who have blastocystis, they have the best bacteria. At least that's what our gastroenterologist colleagues say. So they do not comply with these European guidelines that have actually been published in gastroenterology. It says in gastroenterology that donors cannot be positive for blastocystis. However, they fail to say which methods should be used to test for blastocystis. Because if you use microscopy, you are likely to miss blastocystis. So that's a very interesting conversation. Okay, uh, in this review in Trends in Parasitology, um, Mark van der Giesen came up with this very nice um, a sort of overview about why blastocystis might not be present and it all has to do with hypoxia. If you have a environment, if you have eubiosis, you have a lot of obligate anaerobes, and that's basically what you have. You have a lot of short-chain fatty acids, you have got hypoxia, and blastocystis thrives because it's an anaerobic, it's a strictly anaerobic parasite. On the other hand, if you have dysbiosis, you have a predominance of facultative aerobes or anaerobes, whatever you want to call that, actually, that doesn't really matter. Uh, but they can tolerate uh, oxygen, so the um, short-chain fatty acids level go down. It's, it's very nicely explained in the figure legend. I won't go through this uh, with you here. But the, the result is that because of this, uh, the amount of oxygen suddenly present in the gut makes it difficult for blastocystis to stay put, so blastocystis vanishes. That's also something that I would like you to try and contemplate. So, um, which way forward? I think we are learning a lot from genomics now, and transcriptomics, and metabolomics, and whatever we have. Uh, it's difficult to interpret some of the data, but we're getting there. In vitro uh, experiments and in vivo uh, experiments are also critical. Animal experimental models should be possible. We know now that rats can be infected by uh, human subtype 1, and you can actually see patent colonization going on for more than one year. So, also one thing about culture. If you can induce cysts in cultures, that would enable you to use that for animal experimental models. You can challenge rats with cysts, and you can make baseline observations on the microbiota a couple of weeks before inoculation. How did the microbiota, what was it like? Challenge, and then monitor what happens to the microbiota upon challenge with these cysts. Um, I would very much like to do that as well but uh, we don't have uh, experimental animal, animal facilities. So, 
to sum up uh, some of these uh, about the clips here, uh, so for, for some of these clips, genetic diversity is surprisingly high. We know that, for instance, within Iod amoeba, we have 31% diversity across small subunit rRNA gene. Iod amoeba, a parasite, you know it all. Um, you have morphologically similar isolates, same situation as in blastocystis. You can see genetic difference by 31% across the small subunit RNA gene. Wow. And we have the same in Endolimax. So, a lot of genetic diversity. What does it mean? Okay. We have also come to realize that some clips are very common and often more common in gut healthy individuals than in those with functional and inflammatory bowel disease, contrary to previous general belief. And thirdly, we have identified robust links between clips and gut bacteria, and this includes um, uh, blastocystis as well. So we should try to contemplate intestinal parasitic protests as regulators or modulators of gut microbiota and host immunity maybe even. Uh, we should try and learn to see them as indicator organisms. Of course, we should also try and find out whether they can actually be directly involved in pathogenesis or genesis. But we need those randomized controlled treatment studies also to see what happens when you eradicate blastocystis from the gut. But then you are in trouble because what drug would you use? Um, and of course, there is also some talk about what's inside blastocystis. Is blastocystis capable of passing on viruses? for instance, to the gut environment. So I urge you all and encourage you to try to unravel eukaryotic diversity in the human gut. This is a very interesting area. We can use it for so much, for so many conditions. All diseases stem from the gut, we know. Um, and lastly, I would like you to... Um, know about the fact that we are going to have ICOPA in Copenhagen uh, in 2022. We call it ICOPENHAGEN. Uh, so we expect to see you there and uh, hope that this will be a conference with a lot of blastocystis uh, talks as well. So uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much. Dr. Stenswold, questions, please? Thank you, Rune. Uh, ex excellent talk, very engaging as usual, and uh, very interesting um, uh, theories pushed forward. Um, uh, maybe a comment and, and a question. Um, so, we have shown and others have shown that there's a lot of um, um, blastocystis in rats. And perhaps I'd just like to let the audience know that we don't get blastocystis in mice. And they are very closely related. You know, when we do rat experiments, we also do mouse experiments. But uh, mice can only be infected with blastocystis after some form of manipulation. Um, for us, we treat the mice with a bit of DSS. Uh, other groups have uh, used immunocompromised mice. And only then the mice would uh, have some kind of infection. I think it's quite interesting because genetically they are very similar organisms and yet uh, rats are thriving, have blastocystis thriving in them and, and mice don't. So maybe um, one question is what, what are your views on that? And the second question is um, that amoebiasis entamoeba study in Africa um, done by Laura, Laura Siegel. Um, was that linked to, with high diversity? Uh, was asymptomatic colonization of entamoeba linked to high diversity of the uh, Off the top of my head, I can't really remember, but what I really, um, um, what I remember from that paper was the fact that they could predict the presence of entamoeba based on the um, composition of the microbiota. So that's what I found interesting, and that's what I thought of, that was my sort of take home message from that paper. Uh, but obviously it means a lot how you sort of, uh, um, put your cohort together. With regard to the, uh, the rodents, uh, I don't have any strong uh, views or knowledge on that, but 
I can tell you that one study that is on my mind that I would like to carry out is that um, you know I would like to sample a lot of different rodents because in Denmark we have a lot of rodents. I want wild rodents. I want to see what's out there in Denmark. Uh, I want mice. I want rats. Uh, I want shrews, the insectivores. Um, I want voles and moles because they're all different. Uh, they are like in three different groups and also from different habitats. I want those that are living under the, the soil or in the soil and those that are in you know, like uh, forest area and those that are probably out in the open. So also to get some different environments. Uh, I know that we need a lot of sampling, but it should be possible. Uh, and then simply just find out about the colonization rate in these because that would be one step towards uh, identifying because they are very different in terms of the physiology and anatomy of the uh, intestinal system. And I, I have this strong feeling that there might be a link there. So it could be easy or relatively easy uh, because uh, sampling shouldn't be too much of a problem. Thank you. More questions? Hi, Run. Uh, I have. <clears throat> Two questions. First, because in our experience, uh, it's very uh, <laughs> it's very rare to find the entamoeba fragilis here. So, but you're showing us that in Denmark you yeah. have a population with 100% of the fragilis. What do you think, or how how could you explain that? That, for example, in a developing country where we should have also like a high frequency of these parasites. Thank you for that question. Uh, I would really love to have more uh, Diane's Mieber uh, conferences <laughs> because it's such an interesting parasite too. Um, my interest in Diane's Mieber started in 2004, 5, 6 uh, when the Australians published papers on Diane's Mieber. And in Australia, the prevalence of Diane's Mieber is not very high. Uh, and they sort of incriminated it as a cause of diarrhea. And then I thought, okay, we don't know anything about Diane's amoeba in Denmark, let's set up a test, let's go out and investigate. And then we found that some of the patient samples that we received were actually positive. And then of course we took to, then we imp implemented testing for Diane's amoeba in our routine protest panel. So we had Entamoeba histolytica, Georgia, Cryptosporidium, and Diane's amoeba. And we did that. Uh, and then it turned out that then the pediatricians became very, very interested in this and we had a lot of positive samples. And actually we saw that uh, maybe 80% of the samples from the seven-year-olds are positive for Diane's amoeba. So Diane's amoeba is all over the place in Denmark and especially in um, children. So we have this peak among the seven-year-olds and then it goes down and then we have this parental peak a smaller peak in the parents. And we see the exact same distribution for pinworm, for interobius, which might be the vector for Diane's amoeba, because to my in my opinion, we don't really have a cyst stage for Diane's amoeba, so it's transmitted by a vector. Why is it so? Do you have pinworm in Colombia? You have a lot of pinworm. What we did at some point was that we took pinworm eggs and we surface sterilized these eggs by hypochlorite, we extracted DNA from the washing buffer. There was no evidence of Diane's amoeba fragilis. And then we cracked open the eggs, we DNA extracted the eggs, and inside the eggs we found evidence of Diane's amoeba because we had positive PCR and we sequenced it. So there was Diane's amoeba DNA within the eggs of Enterobius vermicularis. It's no proof that this is the transmission mode, but it's a, it's a hint, isn't it? I can't answer your question. I just um, encourage more surveys using PCR and sequencing because the Australians, they keep blaming us. They say, yeah, your real-time PCR is unspecific. No, it's not because we take uh, subsamples and we sequence it by Sanger sequencing and it's always Diane's amoeba. So Diane's amoeba is a very common parasite in Denmark, in Sweden, in the Netherlands all of Northern Europe. I don't know, maybe it's our sort of parasite. And it's also funny in the way that we, we, we like to think that in Denmark and in Scandinavia we have supreme hygienic levels. 
but somewhere something might go wrong because we see all of this fecal oral transmission. <laughs> so yeah, maybe something about hand washing. <laughs> and the second question, uh, have you found other parabasalids apart from the entamoeba? I saw yeah. the trichomonas, but is that frequent or we, at only the no. fragilis? At, at, some t at some point we look for pentatrichomonas, I think we look for histomonas, or now what is it called, the other one? Pentatrichomonas and enteromonas. I think maybe we had one positive out of uh, 100 samples and so, so it's not really something that we see. But I, I was also very interested in this. Is this something that you see in Colombia? Yes, but I don't know. Joanne is here. Yes, because we found defragilis, histomonas, and I don't remember, just histomonas and defragilis, but in a very low frequency. I mean. And you used uh, real-time PCR? Uh, we use conventional PCR. Conventional PCR. That should be fine as well, yeah, yeah. Yes, but it's really rare. And how, uh, I think Rudolfo had, uh, yeah, you had uh, data on? Yeah, I yes, surprisingly, surprisingly I, I found that no few, very few reports talking with people here about the intamoeba, except you, yeah. we were talking about yesterday. We have 21% of all the parasites of, of our boys that I showed yesterday. And um, it's, I don't know why, there are peaks of the intamoeba, and then it follows, and then a, we don't see no one, and then together, half of the, the intamoeba found are together with pinworms, and another yeah. part do not. Yeah, and that might, might be because you can clear pinworm and still have dying intamoeba, so you shouldn't look, look for too much. No, it's, it's not there. a rule at all, yeah, yes. Yeah. But, but I know in Turkey you also have dying intamoeba, for instance. I know that you have published, or at least your colleagues have published some papers on uh, dying intamoeba as well. So it's present there, at least also, yeah. I, uh, I will have an oral presentation. Mainly topic is blastocystis, but at the same time we uh, study the antamoeba. It is so interesting. It is su surprisingly, we, yes, we detected the antamoeba, especially by PCR. Yeah. And I try to <laughs> learn uh, the uh, microscopy because sometimes it is uh, so uh, difficult. Uh, but uh, in Turkey, we will we will publish, uh, I think, many papers in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. One more question down there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, first, thanks. That was amazing data. Um, I I I want to to stumble first on some of your, your um, on the things that you said to make my question. So. Uh, First, I, I would like to know your opinion about the migration of, of diagnostics from uh, traditional methods like microscopy to, to real-time PCR. For example, in Mexico, at least in the, in the hospital where I work, uh, thousands of, of people are treated every year. The budget for the, for, for the hospital reach its end at least at the half year so my question is how to know uh, when is deep enough to, to look for, for something for example just thinking about the, the Donuts case yeah. I love your question thank you very much thank you for giving me that question because I started out with blastocystis using my clinical microbiology glasses and views. Now I would like to go over here and use my public health microbiology glasses. What is the role of blastocystis on a public health scale? I think we should actually forget more or less about blastocystis in the clinical microbiology setting for now, when we don't really have any useful options because you report blastocystis and it might be, what do you use it for? I mean, it, for me, it's more important if you don't have it. For me, that's more interesting. I would like, I would like to say to the clinical microbiologists, just leave it for now. 
I want the gastroenterologists to look at it. I want the ecologists. I want the veterinarians. I want all the other ones to look at blastocystis now. And then, of course, I want somebody also to look at virulence. Can we find any t evidence of virulence for blastocystis? And of course, if we can, then it's time to move back to the clinical microbiology lab and set up the relevant analysis there. But until then, I think we should just leave it. We took Diane's amoeba out of our testing panel recently because it's all over the place. Uh, if we include a blastocystis, we would find it. Well, not so often, because the, the, the samples that we get are from sick people, so the prevalence would not be very high. So, so I just want to try to convince people that it doesn't really belong in clinical microbiology now. It belongs in research, in gastroenterology, ecology, biology, all those places. That's where we need top-notch research in blastocystis now. Okay, I have... Well, first... Thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, have you developed any study related with the uh, intrataxa diversity of other CLIPS members? And if it's related with the profiling in microbiota? This is something that I would very much like to do. For now, we have just looked at blastocystis and diant amoeba, uh, but I would very much like to sort of look into the other ones as well, of course, and I would like to map the genetic diversity. There are so many tools you can use that now. Uh, Illumina, PacBio, MinION, and so on. You can, so the thing is to get rid of, uh, get hold of the samples and maybe try to get really good DNA, for instance, by isolating the cysts. Is you can make a sucrose gradient and you can isolate intamoeba cysts and iodamoeba and endolimix and so on. So uh, really good data to put into the databases because then also we can use our metagenomics data set much better because then we have something that we can map against so the reference databases will be much better. So we need a lot of that as well. There is a lot that we need. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, related to the, what you were commenting about the selection of donors for FMT, do you have a cut of, of uh, abundance of blastocystis? Or cut off? Yeah. To no. Uh, but what we do when we provide our gastroenterologist with the, with the results output is that we rank the, the reads so that the, uh, the most abundant organism with the most reads will be on top. Mm -hmm. So they, they get used to sort of seeing the, 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 the top most common uh, eukaryotic organisms. Um, so sometimes that's blastocystis. And then they will look down and see, okay, what's the, what's the other bacteria there? Are they interesting? Are they, are they Fecalibacterium, Euseburia, etc., etc., um, Acamantia, and so on? What are the, uh, the bacteria? So they, they are sort of building up their own experience. Uh, and they have told me that they're actually most interested in those uh, donors who have blastocystis. Um, whereas, may some, for instance, some that have a predominance of Saccharomyces may not be such, a, such good donors. That's also something people... Saccharomyces, when we see that in stool, why do we see it? Is it an active colonizer or does it stem from food? What, is, what about the yeast? I remember we once saw um, a, a complete sort of um, opposite distribution of these um, organisms. So if we had a lot of yeast in the sample, we didn't have blastocystis and vice versa. I can comment a little bit about that because I think what, uh, what happened is that as we were discussing, there can be some transient microorganisms versus permanent members. And in the case of fungi, and especially Saccharomyces, I think it's quite difficult to differentiate if it's coming from the diet or actually it's living on your gut, no? And I think we are lucky when we are looking for proteins because they are unlikely that uh, you will eat them. I mean, depending yeah. of, the, yeah. of the lifestyle of the, of the population. <clears throat> well, more questions? We have six more minutes. <laughs> Hi, Rune. Uh, amazing presentation. Uh, I have to ask you if you want to talk more about the relationship between the diet 
and the presence of blastocystis, uh, thinking about uh, the difference between the diet in Western population, Eastern population, yeah. rural versus urban. Uh, I, uh, I have no detailed uh, information for you there, but uh, there are two people who have done some research on this. If you look up papers by Laura Parfrey uh, and papers by uh, Pauline Scanlan, they have made comparisons between US citizens and citizens in rural Africa, for instance, and other populations. Uh, and they have made some speculations about why those microbiomes are so different and why blastocystis is so uncommon in the US while very, very common. It's it's, it's very likely to reflect the diet, the fibers. When you have to uh, ferment fibers, you, you get short-chain fatty acids and you have to have some certain bacteria to do those short-chain fatty acids. If you, if you eat a lot of protein and carbs, you won't have this process going on. Maybe you, you remove the food from blastocystis and that's what we need Andrew Roger and, and, and things uh, or uh, people, lovely people like him to help us understand what is blastocystis capable of doing? What's the metabolism? How does it live? What does it, uh, what does it live from? Um, so yeah, the, the requirements. So yeah, I think it's very possible a diet thing, and that relates very much to this uh, intestinal uh, anatomy thing as well. Do hosts have a cecum or not? Some hosts have a very elaborate cecum, and you'll find a lot of blastocystis in those uh, animals. And if you find a very, very consistent subtype distributions, these are very likely natural hosts of blastocystis. That's something that we should all keep in mind. If we have a sporadic, rare, random distribution of subtypes in a host group, they are probably not natural hosts. One more last question. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that wonderful <coughs> talk. I learned, thank you. I learned a lot. And I would like to comment something about the, uh, in the medical way, because uh, as you say, it's very important that gastroenterologists, medicine, and the other part of the medicine practice get involved in this kind of uh, research. Because we, like most of us, do the basic research. But we have to connect this with the clinic. Yeah. But if we don't show to the medical clinic that blastocystis is a problem, with I speak like a medic, I am like a medical doctor. We don't. We uh, I mean we used to know that blastocystis is just a commensal. Yeah. Yeah. Is we we get some microscopic analysis and the, the report like is blastocystis there. We only see like the, well, this is common, it's normal. Yeah. It's not a, it's not this parasite is not the cause of the symptomatology. I, th I, th I think for now you you uh, so yeah. may, maybe if you don't pro if you, we had to make some proof that <coughs> something is the pathogen, but paras blastocystis is pathogenic because it, in other ways the medical. The miracles, it doesn't care. It doesn't care about blastocystis. So in that way, we will never get some treatment or, another, uh, or, or go forward to find out a solution because maybe this can be a health problem. Yeah. So I agree, and that goes very well along the lines of what I just said. So uh, thank you for that comment. I agree. Well, thanks again, Dr. Stensbold. Um With this, I close this section. Um, Okay, and now we invite, we invite Dr. Raul Tito from Peru. Dr. Tito is a postdoctoral researcher at the Leuven Center for Microbiology in Belgium. And he will talk about beyond genius and human microbiome. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm Raul Tito, I'm Peruvian but I am working right now in Belgium. So I'm gonna, what I will present today is my experience with blastocystis and its associations with um, 
gut microbiota in people from Belgium, especially the Flemish population. And for the, the ones that don't know about uh, the Flemish, I will tell you during, the, during my presentation um, how uh, or what they have distinct in, compared to the Wallon population in Belgium. Okay, now let's start. So how human are you? I was telling that we are populated by bacteria in and out our body. I will throw some numbers. For example, the total number of bacteria in our body can be two to 10 times more, uh, more than the human cells that conform our human body. And then the total number of bacteria genes can be 100 times more than the total human genes. So we are a multi-domain super organism. <clears throat> the human gut microbiota is the um, collection of all different microorganisms that are living in the intestinal tract. And they can be, this community can be modified by different factors, like for example, host genetic, food, microbial exp exposure, or um, drugs like antibiotics. Now, we know that microbiota is helping us with different functions, for example, uh, breaking down food um, compounds, provide, uh, helping us with a resistance to pathogens, pro doing protection against epithelial injury, among others, like for example, biosynthesis of vitamins and amino acids that our cells are not able to do. Now, we know, uh, as I was saying, that we know quite a lot of gut microbiota, but as a reality check, we don't know even we even know what a healthy microbiota flora means. What I'm saying is that there are so much variation in the healthy that we cannot put the limits on what is normal gut microbiota. For example, we don't have too much, enough information about variation in clinically relevant populations, temporal variation and stability of biomarkers. And factors influencing gut microbiota, influencing gut flora composition and effect of environment. And in addition, most of the studies are focused on bacteria in archaea. <clears throat> but based on the evidence that we have for some microbiota studies in disease populations, we know that some diseases, like for example, IBD, uh, diabetes, and some uh, cases of arthritis, are associated with low bacteria diversity. And diversity can be translated as a the gut Higher diversity in the gut can be translated as a more stable and resilient ecosystem. That means that it can be less perturbed, less modified by an external uh, uh, microorganism. Now, there are quite a lot of big hubs in terms of how microbiome, the microbiome field or the findings on the microbiome field can be translated to diagnostic and treatment for several diseases. But please remember, we are a multi-domain microorganism. Ar ar we are archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotic cells. And um, one more thing to keep in mind is that most of the studies in gut microbiota use as a proxy stool samples. Now, this is quite important because we are making a lot of inference of what's happening in the intestinal tract using a stool sample. <clears throat> now, as Rung was mentioning, one of the um, most promising um, areas where in, in, micro, in microbiome where we are having good results is FMT, for example. But what does mean FS, FMT? Uh, it's transfer of a stool sample from a healthy donor to a patient that has an intestinal disorder. For example, in the case of um, people with um, metabolic syndrome, the transfer of link donors increase the insulin sensitivity in, the individuals, in, in these individuals. Now, in the case of, for example, infections with Clostridium difficile, we see that FMT works much better than antibiotics. And this result, that is only the results of the donors, what we have here is the diversity of the donors, or, or how many different species, this donors uh, have, show clearly 
that donors that have low diversity, compared to donors that have high diversity, we have a different outcome in the, in the um, recipients. This study was published with our gastroenterology collaborator, and after that, similar to what uh, Rung is doing in Denmark, we are screening the samples for high, diverse, for high bacteria diversity before they are used in order to uh, perform the FMTs. So this, poly, this project has a catchy name, is looking for the super donors. <clears throat> but now, how that can be related with the, for me, for the hero of these four days, blastocystes, because I think that is at least for in the Flemish population, and it seems that in Denmark too, samples that have uh, that can, samples that have to be ex excluded following these guidelines will remove the most uh, diverse ones in terms of bacteria and archaea composition. So I feel a little embarrassed to show this slide because I mean, anyway, you know more <laughs> than myself about blastocystis, but. Uh, I will just uh, summarize that it's a single cell eukaryote and its role is unclear in health and disease. And its prevalence can reach up to 50% in European countries and up to 100% in developing countries. And it's estimated that 15% of the world population are carriers of this uh, single cell eukaryote. Now, what we know about blastocystis and the human gut microbiota? Basically, I'm just I, uh, summarizing some of the um, uh, findings that Rum put to air in his review of this year. <clears throat> so, uh, from this study that was performed by Rum's group, doing the reanalysis of the data of Dani Danish and Spanish populations, they found that the carriers have higher bacteria richness and they are associated to Prevotella and Ruminococcus enterotype and negative associated to Bacteroides enterotype. And in this study from Alderberg, from a cohort in France, <clears throat> they identified that carriers have higher bacterial diversity. Now, in this meta-analysis by Beghini, uh, they identified that carriers have lower BMI, and they co-occur, blastocystes co-occur with, with metanobrevibacter, and they confirmed that uh, negative association of blastocystes with bacteroides. Nash, using a population, a cohort from US, from the um, Human Gut Project. They identify that carriers have higher bacterial diversity and abundance of Clostridia and lower abundance of Enterobacteria CIA. Forsell, a study from a, Swedish, a small Swedish cohort of travelers, they identify that carriers have lower bacteroides and higher bacterial richness. And recently, a Mexican group, Nieves, uh, Nieves Ramirez, identified that carriers have absence of gastrointestinal diseases or inflammation and higher bacterial diversity. I really like this paper because uh, they were the first ones that measured calprotectin in, bla in, blastocyst in samples, carriers of, uh, positive for blastocystes, and then they have... Uh, they have uh, information about intestine, about local intestinal, inf local inflammation. Now, but what we can see from all these different studies that all these associations at, at, are at the level of genus. But although they present information about subtype distribution, or in this, in the in the career populations, there are no association of specific subtype with uh, metadata. <clears throat> Therefore, my question was. Are blastocystes subtype associated with different gut mi microbial communities? Um, if, if so, is diversity, microbial composition, if what uh, genera of bacteria or archaea co-occur with blastocystes, which ones have a co-exclusion, and which type of metadata can be associated to a specific subtype? Now, um, <clears throat> In order to address this question, luckily I have access to the large cohort in, in, in my group in order to test the association with the 
in a population with a, without uh, active disease or asymptomatic, the FGFP, the Flemish Gut Flora Project. And in this one, I try to identify differences among carriers of different blastocystis subtypes. And my second group was a group of patients with IBD. And in this one, I tried to test the negative association of blastocystis and unhealthy gut microbiota, because it's already reported that IBS microbiota has lower diversity and has several um, genera that are not uh, common in um, asymptomatic people. So right now, let me tell you a little bit more about the FGFP, is the Flemish Gut Flora Project. It's a longitudinal study of around 5,000 5, volunteers. Um, uh, Belgium has a population size of our around 12 million people, and it's split it in three regions. Uh, North, Wallon, the South Wallon, that they speak French, uh, Brussels, the capital of Belgium, and North Flanders, where they speak Dutch. So I did the study in uh, the Dutch population that we call, or they call them, uh, they call themselves Flemish because they speak Dutch, but actually is a, a, a Dutch that not, doesn't share too much with the Dutch from, from, from Holland. Um, as you can see in this uh, slide, here I'm trying to uh, show the location where the sample, where the participants were recruited. And red means, all the uh, red are all the female participants and blue are the male participants. As, as you can see, there are more females willing to participate in this type of projects. That is quite common with, uh, with other projects that are involved, not only in Belgium, in other parts of the world. So next, uh, let me, we collect stool samples, blood and saliva samples. A stool to characterize uh, the microbiota, blood samples to characterize metabolic markers, and saliva samples to uh, measure um, uh, cortisol. Now, this cohort has extensive metadata. As you can see here, we have self-reported health status, a detailed reported health status do by the general practitioner, diet, including probiotics and drugs, well-being, information uh, through questionnaires of lifestyle, hygiene, bowel habits through Bristol stool score scale, tra uh, information and uh, extra information. So at the moment, we have 3,400 sample sets collected, and right now we are running the FGFP long, what is a, a sampling collection during three months for 300 people, where we are collecting samples every week, the first month, every day, the second month, and every week, the third month. And with this information, we are planning to to see um, temporal um, variability of the microbiota. <clears throat> uh, important part of this project was the logistic. And as you can see here, well, um, sample collection is quite uh, difficult for this, type, uh, for this size of, of projects. What we end up doing is we put together a kit that we send it to the participants, send it home to the participants, where they have tubes, gloves, uh, labels, and then information about how to rate the, the um, consistency of the stool, um, more formats in order to, uh, to, to perform all other, uh, to collect all, all, all this data. <clears throat> then the second part was the storage and the transport. So these samples were collected at home, and then we asked them to put them at minus 20, and then take them to the, to the pharmacy uh, using ice packs. And from the pharmacy, the courier took them to our laboratory using dry ice. Um, all the samples were extracted uh, using uh, uh, automatic platforms and uh, using a, sing uh, a single protocol. If you want to have some more information about the logistics of this project, you can check this paper from my colleague. 
<clears throat> uh, now, what we found in the first report, focus on bacteria and archaea for this population, we used 1,106 samples, 503 metadata variables, and we identified 69 microbiota covaries. What is a microbiota covaries? A microbiota covaries is a variable that can <coughs> explain inter-individual microbiota variation. For example, the top covari in, a, in this study was Bristol stool, score, uh, uh, Bristol stool score, that is a proxy for transient time. <coughs> and the second covari was age, followed by red blood uh, cell counts and the usage or no of amoxicillin. So we identify, as I say, 69 microbiota covaries, 18 of them were not redundant. <clears throat> now, I will tell you a little, bit, a little bit more about stool consistency. So we did a previous study only with 54 participants, and we found the same association that a higher richness is a Positively correlate, negatively correlated with a Bristol stool score. Now, what's the Bristol stool score? It's a system to uh, categorize the, the stool material. So it goes from one to seven, one being the hard rock material to liquid. <laughs> and you can see uh, we found that number seven is being associated with Prevotella, and number one is being associated, negative associated with Prevotella, uh, positive associated with Bacteroides and with the Ruminococcus. <coughs> now, extra findings of this study. For example, we found a direct association with antibiotic, laxative, immunosuppressants, and hormones. All these variables that are not taken into consideration in several of the microbiome studies that are, has been performed. And in addition, we uh, try to confirm some of previous associations, like for example, or previous results about um, gut microbiota. One of them is that there was a different microbiota in uh, people that was born by cesarean or by vaginal birth. Um, we didn't find these differences. Breastfed or no, no differences. Home versus hospital, no differences. Rural versus city, childhood, no differences, and all these after correction for age, gender, and BMI. But one more thing to, uh, but one thing to remember, this was done in, uh, f uh, in Belgium, and in, in Belgium exactly for the Flemish population. No? Now, I provide quite a lot of information on my first population, and I just have this slide for the second, is the IBD cohort. It was 107 participants with active IBD that were recruited at the Leuven Hospital, and 31 with ulcerative colitis, 76 with Crohn's disease, nine females, 98 males, and the mean age was 42.8, the mean BMI 24.3, the mean disease activity 122 months. <clears throat> now, before I start showing the results, I wanted to I want to show you a little bit about the methodology. So. <clears throat> this pair of primers are commonly used in several microbiome studies. And if we check these primers for co-amplification of eukaryotes, we will see that in the original report of the primers by Walters, it amplifies several eukaryotic taxa. And if we see here, it amplifies strong menopiles. Now, we put together all different uh, several subtypes for blastocystes, and we align them, and then we align the primers, and we saw that these primers should, um, should be ampl uh, amplifying blastocystes sequences too. Now, just to remember, we, I have two uh, populations, the Flemish Gaflora project, my asymptomatic population, and the IBD cohort. So what we did is we characterized the bacteria archaea and eukarya using the 16 is rna b 4 primers, with next generation sequencing, and we confirm the presence of blastocystes status carrier by specific PCR primers for the 18S RNA molecule. <clears throat> so, 
First result, we have 100% of concordance by next generation sequencing and blastocystis 18S RNA marker genus specific PCR. Second, we did not find correlation between number of reads assigned to blastocystis and the total number of reads generated using the set of primers for B416S RNA gene. So here we have that reads that were uh, that match blastocystis per each sample. And here we have the total number of reads of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryote. And as we can see, for example, the a stool sample with more reads, more total reads, is negative for blastocystis. And there are several that have more than uh, 80,000 reads that are negative for blastocystis. This was just a quality check to see if we will have a um, um, perfect correlation, because, or close to a perfect correlation, because that can tell us that there was something wrong with the, with the methodology. Now, comparing the microbiota of IBD versus Flemish gut flora project, as we can see in this plot, this plot is a PCOA plot. Um, what we see here is, is the, um, a reductional view of the microbiota composition. What I'm saying is, for example, these two plots, are, these two triangles are two different, is the microbiota representation of two different participants. And since they are cl close, they share quite a lot of microbiota. So the microbiota is very similar. And they are color coded by the two populations, Lubin with this color and the FGFP by the other color. And, sim and, and I have symbols for the non-carriers and the carriers. And as you can see, for carriers in the Lubin cohort, we have only one, two, three, and four, while for the other cohort, we have a bunch, especially in this area. Now, there is not a a perfect uh, structure of these two cohorts, but we need to remember that this is only two dimensions. So we apply a test to try to identify how much of the variation can be explained using this variable, IBD, no IBD, and we see that we can explain 12.4% of the variation and it's highly significant. <clears throat> now, uh, in terms of microbial, and archaea diversity of these two cohorts. We see that the diversity of the Flemish gut flora project compared to the IBD population is significantly higher. Something that is already known that the diversity in people with IBD is, the bacteria and archaea diversity in people with RBD is significantly lower. Now, in terms of um, prevalence of blastocystis in these two co cohorts, uh, we see that in the FM, FGFP is 30% and in the IBD is 4%. And in terms of distribution of different subtypes, in the FGFP, is 20, is, we have we identified the four major subtypes. In addition, other su subtypes in that were less prevalent. And in IBD, only subtype 1 and subtype 3. <clears throat> now, I will focus the analysis only in the FGFP uh, population because I will start making comparison between different subtypes. And obviously, I cannot make comparisons for the other cohort. <clears throat> now, just to put in a context these results, I reanalyzed the data from two other large uh, microbiome uh, projects. One that is uh, perf uh, the American Gut Project, that is a project in US and uh, a cohort from UK. And as you can see, in terms of prevalence of the most, uh, the most prevalent subtypes are one, two, three, and four in the, in the three uh, cohorts. And in the Flemish gut flora project, we find the four, uh, first four subtypes in addition to subtype seven and subtype eight. And there are some subtypes that uh, we were not able to identify them or to classify them based on the sequence information that we generated. And in the case of the American GAT project, we have the four, but then we have six, we have seven, eight, nine, and some mixed uh, carriers. And in UK, it's quite similar to the Flemish GAT project, although subtype four is significantly uh, 
high, uh, the prevalence of subtype 4 is significantly higher compared to the prevalence of subtype 4 in the Flemish gut flora project. <coughs> Uh, now, comparing relative abundance of uh, the, between the different subtypes, we found that abundances of blastocystes is significantly higher in subtype 4 carriers than in subtype 3 carriers. <coughs> and now, I will just focus my analysis to these four subtypes, because for subtype A, I only have two, and for subtype 7, I only have four. First, we did a comparison of the subtype, the career or no career status, a specific subtype um, and no career status with all our metadata. And this is the only variable that was significant. So, careers of blastocystis subtype 4 are significantly older than non careers. So, age was the only variable that was significant. And you can see it there. And then I make this histogram. Where it is clear, uh, where you you can see that um, the um, the distribution of age per uh, age bracket. Now there are uh, reports where they link blastocystis with IBS, as we were, uh, we heard in some of the of the talks. So we try to test or we test that in our cohort because we have some people with IBS. And as you can see, we did not find any significant result when we did a comparison of car uh, careers with IBS, car uh, career status of IBS with, with non IBS, or a specific subtype distribution um, for IBS or no IBS um, participants. In terms of microbiota, similar thing, there are no differences in their microbiota. And comparing relative abundance of blastocystes between the no IBS and IBS, no significant results. <clears throat> then, this uh, plot similar to the one that I presented for uh, when I was comparing the FGFP cohort versus the IBS. In this case, it's only for the FGFP, and it's color coded by non carriers, by pluses, uh, sorry, is uh, the, the the plus is for the no carriers, the dot for the carriers, and the colors are for the different enterotypes. And as we can see there, we have uh, several uh, pluses of, with this color and several dots with the prevotella and with the ruminococcus, ruminococaceae color. So after performing the test, we identify that carriers are negatively associated with bacteroides enterotype. Subtype 4 is positively associated with Rominococaceae enterotype. And this finding was already reported by um, other groups. Then we tried to do something, we did something similar, that, uh, a similar analysis, like in the first, in the um, in the first paper, in the result from the first paper that I show you, that it was bacteria and archaea focus. But now we include the blastocystes variables like a genus carrier status, genus relative abundance, subtype carrier status, or subtype abundance for, his, or for his, each specific subtype. And then we find out that the top variable now is one that classifies blastocystes by status and non carriers, followed by Bristol Stuhl score. And this was, for me, I was really ha I was quite happy. But for my colleagues, they <laughs> not so. They asked me to please, to double check this part because now I was um, blastocystis status was outclassing uh, a proxy of stool uh, consistency. <clears throat> well, yeah. um, then we have age, red, uh, amoxicillin type of, of, of bread. Um, then we identified 30, 32 microbiota covaris, 17 not redundant covaris, and now we can explain 11% of the inter-individual variation of the mic inter-individual microbiota variation. <coughs> um, comparing carriers versus no carriers, we identify 38 genera that have different significant, different abundances between careers and no careers. Well, it was, I will mention some that 
were already reported, like for example, Acromancia, uh, Bacteroides, uh, Metanobrevibacter. But since I was not too interested in this part, and what I wanted to see is differences between difference, differences, genera that have different relative abundance in different subtypes, we found four, Acromancia, Anaerotroncus, Coprobacter, and Enterococcus. For example, in the case of Acromancia, the relative abundance of uh, Acromancia in, in carriers of subtype 4 is significantly higher compared to subtype 3. And in the case of Anaerotroncus, <coughs> the, the, the abundance of Anaerotroncus is higher in subtype 1 compared to subtype 2, and is higher in subtype 3 compared to subtype 2, and higher in subtype 4 compared to subtype 2. And for Coprobacter, is similar to what we have for Acromancia and Enterococcus. Uh, it has a, a subtype 2 is, is a higher compared to subtype 4 and 3. Now, looking for co uh, occurrence or co exclusion, as you can see here, uh, Acromancia is uh, negative correlated because it's blue with subtype 3 and positive correlated with subtype 4. Coprobacter is positive correlated with subtype 4 and negative correlated with subtype 3. Metanobrevibacter, positive correlated with subtype 4. And anaerotroncus, uh, positive correlated with subtype 4 and negative correlated with for subtype 2. <coughs> Finally, in terms of diversity, microbial and archaea diversity, we found that all the subtypes have higher bacteria diversity bacteria and archaea diversity compared to the non-carriers. And uh, subtype, subtype 2 and 4 have higher bacteria diversity compared to subtype 3. <coughs> now, what we can conclude from these results? Uh, blastocystis prevalence is significantly higher in the no disease Flemish population. We identify four major blastocystis subtypes detected in the Flemish gut flora project, and blastocystis is less prevalent in the bacteroides enterotype individuals. Blastocystis subtype status explains the larger fraction of the variation of the gut bacteria and archaea microbial communities. Blastocystis subtype 4 is associated with older age, acromancia abundance, and ruminococcacea enterotype. Now, what I want to say, fine, uh, uh, my, my take home message is that blastocystis is a common constituent of the Flemish healthy gut microbiota, will reduce prevalence in patients with active IBD. Subtype characterization is essential for assessing the relationship between blastocystis, microbiota profile, and host health. And donor selection for fecal transplantation should not exclude blastocystis career. And this is related with a similar project that we have, similar project to Rune's uh, project that we have in, in Belgium. And the definition of normal variation and confounder is essential towards robust microbiome, microbiome diagnostic. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I will. Thank you very much, Raúl. Very interesting your exposition. So, um, I have. May I start with the questions? <laughs> With many questions. <laughs> we have, okay. Um, we have, yeah, we have 10 minutes. No. No, 10 minutes. Okay. So, um, there are 59 microbiomes, uh, co varieties, and they, they, you detected 11% inter individual variation. So, it, it is. Um, the key to speak about or better, how, can, how could we define dysbiosis um, with this spectrum? And one way is to have as much data you can, and then you can include that in your model when you are trying to make the comparison between a healthy and and this is a, a study. So we should rethink about dysbiosis 
uh, word. Mm. Until we should be made, make more yeah, continuous sure, but studies. I mean, the, 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 the diabetes exists. It's just that we cannot claim that it's due to uh, hamburgers. I mean, we need to see that maybe that person is taking uh, or was taking quite a lot of antibiotics or um, oh, well, in the case of Belgium, he was eating too much chocolate or beer because those are two uh, cobaris that we identify based on this analysis. Mm -hmm. That's <coughs> good, thank you. Any other question? Dr. Kibbing. Thank you, Raul. Uh, very, very good talk. I think uh, Thanks. You were, we had breakfast together. You said you were very worried. Uh, uh, you know, and, uh, but this is like one of the best talks <laughs> I've heard in a long time. So well done. Uh, not Thank just you in your delivery, much. but uh, in this, um, leading this whole project. I'm, I'm blown away by the data and very impressed. So I just have one, one question. You uh, talked about the subtype resolution uh, and in terms of well, whatever effects there were. Uh, uh, with uh, diversity and so on. Can you bring it down to allelic levels? Is there allelic resolution for your samples? So could you stratify them further yes. into um, alleles? I have to be very conservative and I think to, to, to go to a level of allele, I need to use the standard procedure and I will do it. Okay. Because it's a different region. It's not the region that is being used for uh, uh, allele uh, uh, stratifi uh, classification. So you only sequence the ribosomal, uh, the, the 18S, is it? You, it yes. wasn't a, a full genome? No, it's uh, only a 18S. 400 basis uh, ah, okay. fragment. Okay. okay. But you did get some, I mean, there were some statistical differences already between the subtypes. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, so my, uh, my future plans is to try to go to allele level, but then we need to uh, increase the population size. I mm. mean, we have right now 500 positive uh, uh, participants for blastocystis. Um, maybe there I can have enough numbers to try to do comparisons at the level, at the, at the allele level. But okay. I will need to first uh, um, uh, use the standard uh, protocol to assign alleles. So um, just a second question. Uh, I find it quite interesting that you have a subtype uh, effect uh, because many studies have, have shown that you know, subtypes have no, no effect on, on a number of phenotypes. What's your thought on how these subtypes are influencing the bacterial uh, diversity among different populations? Okay. Uh, so you know so you, sh you showed the graph where subtype 1, 2, 3, 4 have different yes, effects. But uh, the studies that you are referring are Comparing gut microbiota? No, I mean, in, in general, people yeah. have shown there's no, <coughs> no, no effect. No, but I, uh, well, I think it's that uh, the genetic makeup of each of these genomes is quite, it's quite different. I mean, we know that by the size of the genomes. No? And then they might have some different combos of virulent factors or, or other, uh, not, not only viral, uh, virulent factors, but other genes that are not present in one of or the other subtype. Thank That's you. why I'm looking forward for, the, for more full genomes. Another question? Justin? Thanks for the lovely talk. Um, I was really surprised that blastocystis was the, the variable that explains most. Do you have any thoughts about that? How, how can that be? I'm, I'm astonished about that. Okay, hmm. I think that it's, it's not clear. We need to identify what's not making this direct connection, but, it, but I think it's associated with uh, stool consistency. And there is a, something that is introducing noise. That's why I was asking everybody that was presenting if they collect information of stool consistency. Uh, may I have a question? Or there's another? <coughs> okay. Andrew? So, sorry, just on that last point, your, the information on the stool consistency was then highly correlated with presence and absence of blasto, is that? No. So there is no association of stool consistency with blastocystis after multiple testing. But what we see is that subtype 4 
correlate with acromancia and with metanobrevibacter. And these two bacteria has been associated with the, the uh, Bristol stool score number one and two, the dark uh, uh, hard stool consist consistency. I see. Um, Ron? Uh, I just want to thank you, Raul. I'm so happy that we have you here. Uh, I was, I was uh, very lucky to be one of the um, reviewers of your PhD, and I was uh, blown away by your work. Not even did you do this Flemish God Microbiota project, but you also did this fantastic study in Peru where you sampled different populations, rural and um, um, urban populations. Uh, you've done so much for blastocystis already, so uh, I'm very happy that you're here. Uh, so um, maybe you answered it already, uh, but in your opinion, why do we keep seeing this negative association between bacteroides and blastocystis? Can you expand on that? Okay, so originally uh, when this concept about enterotypes was uh, proposed, so we have three different enterotypes or community types and each of them is driven by the high abundance of one member, bacteroides, ruminococcus and prebotella. But now our group last year uh, refined this uh, clustering technique and now we have four enterotypes. And what happened is that bacteroides, the, the former bacteroides, now is split in two, bacteroides one and bacteroides two. And bacteroides two, uh, is, it has higher bacteria diversity compared to bacteroides one, and bacteroides one has lower bacteria diversity and in addition, low bacteria density, because this is some new, uh, uh, test that we introduced last year that is uh, in, in order to normalize your microbiome or, micro, uh, or metagenomic data, uh, use, uh, use the total density of bacteria that you have in the stool sample. <clears throat> so interestingly, from two studies that we have with um, disease population, it is uh, the associate, we found a post, uh, high prevalence of bacteroides one in these two diseases. So, what we can, uh, what we are trying to confirm now with other, uh, in, with other um, cohorts, is that the, the, if this bacteroides one is the disease uh, conformation of the microbiota, and well, it is uh, um, as was presented in, in previous talks. So this specific uh, enterotype has a, a high proportion of members that are um, uh, aero, um, not strict anaerobes. So therefore, we don't know if maybe th this is the reason why they are uh, uh, producing inflammation. Um, same thing, we don't know if it's blastocystis. So I mean, right now, I don't have any evidence to speculate, but this is what I can tell you about uh, uh, bacteroides and, and blastocystis. Any other question? Um, Raul, um, I, it's not clear for me the role of yeast with the whole microbiome and the inflammatory bowel disease. Can you, do you any, have any approach on this? Yeast? Yeast. <clears throat> Originally, for my PhD project, I was trying to do a, a full survey of different single cell eukaryotes in the human gut. <clears throat> and one of them was Candida and Saccharomyces. Um, but then at some point, I was so frustrated with controlling contamination that I decided to focus on the protease. Now, there are some reports about yeast and IBD, I mean, Saccharomyces, Candida and IBD. Um, the, what, what I can say is that uh, um, we know that these participants have uh, low bacteria diversity. We know that these participants, participants have low bacteria density. So there are two options. Actually, it's living there or maybe it's contamination because those samples are quite highly prone to be contaminated. In, in our <laughs> clinical experience, um, we have many patients who comes because they have 
distension, flat lens, <clears throat> and almost an um, IBS. But when they change the diet, they stop eating all the s sources of the, the yeast, like wine, cheeses, bread, so, and so forth. They become in a quasi-normal status yeah. of the gut. And um, conversely, we found less blastocystis when they have high the presence of yeast in the stools. We don't know if they are from external or colonizing yeasts. Yeast. So uh, there is uh, much to do around this. Uh, <coughs> because our, the physician says, well, what do I do? do I, should I put them out with a uh, pharmaco or not? And we, we wait to say, let's, let's wait to take out all the sources external sources of yeast in order to try to make it equilibrated. And they get better. Mm, very inter uh, yeah, this is something for sure to, to follow up. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> well, any other question? Yeah. Okay, Liliana? thank you so much. They are very wonderful, really, top, really. Thanks. It was amazing. I learned um, so much from the workshops when you you, in, for your talk, and now I learn a lot. And also, I'm very uh, interested about the Bristol scale. I mean, we never use that. So it's a very, very good point to get some more information and make better our uh, sample, I mean, like get some better association and for the subtai and the, and the form of the from this scale, so may, so absolutely, I will use this scale to see if I can file. Thank you. Thanks, and I can tell you. So, the Bristol stool score can be some, 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 sometimes subjective, but so then then we try to see if we can have a unbiased uh, value that can tell us about that. So we check moisture, uh, so like co uh, water content in, in the stool and it is a much better predictor. But so it, the, uh, well, after that I can provide you details, but it is quite simple to, to obtain yeah, that information. Yeah, it is, but it's also only used for the proto, 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 protocol. Protocol? Ah, uh, proctologist? Yeah, it's the Bristol scale is mm -hmm. all uh, the protocologist. Proctologist medicine is, are the only ones that use this kind of scale. So it's for... No, but what I'm saying is yeah. if you have the frozen sample, yeah. you can take an aliquot mm -hmm. and then put it in the... Lyo, check the weight and put it in the li lyophilizer mm -hmm. for, for 24 or 48 hours and then check the weight again and then you will have the, the value about water content. And that mm -hmm. correlates much better than Bristol Stool score. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Another question? No? Raul. Hi, Raul. We talked a little yesterday at your poster, and you already know I think what you're doing is really interesting. Um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but just in light of um, the other talk of today, it seems like there's this association between fiber content of the diet um, the presence of blastocystis, and we know that there's an association between fiber content of the diet and health of the, or health isn't the right word, I suppose, um, diversity of the gut microbiome. So do you think that there's something going on there linking those three things, blastocystis, micro, um, diversity, and, and uh, fiber content of the diet? And do you think that you have any resolution of that and, and the data that uh, you have here? Thanks for that question. So, uh, not for this uh, for this cohort. Yes, there is an association with fruits, but for um, uh, results that I'm, uh, I, I did not show, that is for unpublished results, from similar to the project that uh, Juan David was showing showing us yesterday. So, I characterized the multi-domain uh, gut microbiota of rural uh, remote communities in Peru. And when we check there, so they have 92% 92, um, 92 prevalence of blastocystis and other single-cell eukaryotes. And then when I was 
my, uh, in, for this experimental design, what I'm trying to look is in multi-domain uh, markers of urbanization. And when I checked the mark, my potential markers, all the single cell eukaryotes were already reported in rumen, in, in, in rumen of different uh, uh, mammals. So, but then I was looking more, I was trying to look for the bacteria that are more potential markers of urbanization. And these two combinations, for example, were present in termites. And these people has a high intake of, of, of fiber in the, their diet. No? And it's not a lot of calories, but it's a, I mean, it's a lot of uh, volume. And I don't know if that answers your question. Another question? <laughs> So, my last, at least. Uh, <laughs> is there any information uh, about the inflammasome activation and blastocystis and that gut regulation that it, that it means? No, I'm not uh, there are many, familiar about There are many protized, like trichomonas. Oh, okay. Uh, there is a paper that uh, talks about uh, the entamoeba involved in the inflammation in mice, and then I think, yeah. <laughs> you, you Can you explain this one a bit? Okay. <laughs> a little bit because I'm not a immunologist, but yes, uh, we found in mice, trichomonas musculis, and, yes. and the, ortholog, the ortholog in humans would be the fragilis in theory. So what we found is that this could be able to, to activate some, some pathways of the inflammasome, and we also found that we're associated with colon cancer, it's the presence only with a TMU. Yes, we published that in, in Cell in 2017. Yeah, uh, it's very recent, <coughs> yes. So but no, yes, I don't know. If no no approach between blastocystis and inflammasome yet? No, we only did it in this mm. parabasalid okay. in TMU. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. If there are no more questions, we say many thanks, Raul, for a wonderful speech. Thank you so much. My project. So I'm going to I'm going to um present the uh, this project, uh, which is titled uh, Potentially, uh, I think, I think this is, the, right? Yeah. So, um, entitled a Potentially Pathogenic Blastocystis Subtype uh, Disrupts Gut Microbiota. Okay, so why study, first of all, why study blastocystis in microbiome? So, but uh, for me, I think also for um, uh, many of you, um, uh, we want to study the blastocysts in the context of the microbiome because we want to complete the picture. Um, there's this uh, there's this paper by uh, a commentary by uh, um, by these people, including uh, Dr. Stansvold. Uh, so we're waiting for the human intestinal eukaryotome, uh, and then also um, uh, this micro microbial eukaryotes, a missing link in the gut microbiome studies. Because as we know, when we study microbiome, most of the time. We just, um, well, people just refer to uh, the bacterial uh, members of the microbiome. Uh, and also, we're very interested because we've been uh, looking at the um, <clears throat> pathogenicity of uh, blastocystis. Um, so this, uh, and, and blastocystis, if, if it can affect the microbiome leading to dysbiosis, then this, would, this could possibly explain the, uh, the pathogenic status of uh, the organism. Um, so the, 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 in the, um, there are a number of uh, blastocysts and microbiome studies, um, but uh, many of them uh, says that uh, blastocysts is associated with the healthy gut microbiota, except uh, this one by the French group uh, in, in, in 2014, and they said that uh, blastocysts is, is associated with a decrease in protective gut bacteria, and its colonization may lead to dysbiosis. However, um, as you can see from the, <clears throat> from the subtypes that have been involved in these studies, uh, they are limited. For example, uh, subtype 7, you can hardly see them uh, in all these studies. Uh, but I'm uh, grateful for the, <clears throat> for the presentation a while ago, uh, um, summarizing this paper, um, and Dr. 
uh, Tito said that, uh, well, in this paper, one of the uh, take-home messages uh, that microbial richness and diversity are linked to blastocyst prevalence and subtype variation. So meaning that um, if I use um, a certain or a specific subtype and, and do uh, microbiome studies, uh, then probably I can, um, this could probably explain the, um, the population or the classification of the microbiome that you can uh, find in, in, in that host. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, only a single subtype in this, uh, in this project. And um, uh, so this is a subtype 7 isolates. Uh, but before uh, going and uh, characterizing the subtype 7 isolates in terms of uh, its uh, pathogenic potential, so just a brief history. Um, so it was isolated in 1991 from a Singaporean patient. As we know, subtype 7 is an avian, uh, is an avian, sub uh, avian uh, subtype. Uh, but then this, uh, well, the, our, our, the, the one I'm using is, uh, is from a human patient. Uh, so uh, it first appeared in literature in 1993, and that was the, uh, when they axonized, uh, when they axonized this, uh, uh, this isolate. Um, well, not just this isolate, but other subtype 7 isolates. And then, uh, well, the, then uh, as the years went by, star, uh, they started to uh, subtype it. Um, well, first uh, using the Yoshikawa uh, um, uh, subtyping, so it was uh, classified as uh, subtype 2. And then the, in the another, another, I think the uh, authored by uh, a Thai researcher, uh, it was um, the Thai Thai Song. Um, um, it was uh, classified as uh, subgroup 6. But then uh, with the consensus, so it was defi uh, definitively uh, placed at the uh, blastocystis subtype uh, 7. So um, this is the uh, Yoshikawa uh, primer uh, um, classification, and then this is the other classification, and they are in the subtype 7 um, uh, classification. So, um, okay, so I'm using subtype 7 isolates, and, um, and I'm saying that they are pathog uh, potentially pathogenic. Uh, and there are uh, plenty of um, uh, evidence uh, in vitro assays uh, that I can use as basis for saying this. Well, first of all, in terms of uh, drug resistance, um, in, this, um, in this paper published by the former PhD in, in our lab, um, he did uh, <clears throat> a susceptibility testing of blastocystis against uh, metronidazole and found out that subtype 7 isolates, uh, B and E, have higher IC50 values uh, compared to uh, subtype 4 isolates. Uh, using uh, these two viability assays, uh, resazurin assay and XCT assay. And not only that, uh, when, I <clears throat> when I was doing my PhD, I, um, we did... Um, we, we tested 1,280 uh, compounds from uh, this uh, library of pharma, pharmacologically active compounds, and uh, we found out that only three drugs can inhibit subtype 7, actually only four drugs can inhibit subtype 7B isolate, so these are the four, uh, while uh, for <clears throat> subtype 4, WR1, and subtype 1, NUH9, uh, there are 11 and 12 drugs that can inhibit them, so these are the, uh, these are the drugs. Okay, but the, these three are common to, uh, to all of them. Uh, but even then, when you look at the, um, these common drugs that can inhibit all of them, still you can find that subtype 7 uh, isolates are relatively resistant. Now, uh, not only in drug resistance, but also in, uh, in terms of um, a disruption of the epithelial barrier. So this is, uh, um, <coughs> this is a paper from the French group, and they... Uh, they, mm, <clears throat> they generated a CAHO2 monolayer, and then uh, they incubated uh, this CAHO2 uh, monolayer with uh, a subtype 7B isolate culture supernatant, and also they uh, purified a, a protein from, uh, a protein from, uh, from the uh, subtype 7B isolate, uh, and then they found out that, um, that in this uh, using flux assay, uh, there was a greater disruption of the epithelial barrier uh, permeability um, in this one. So there's a, a higher flux and also with this uh, protein called catepsin B activated by the uh, legumin. And actually, we also, we also did the same thing, but using other isolates in, in our lab. So this was done by the former PhD student. So we use, uh, she used uh, subtype 4 isolates, uh, uh, WR1 and S1, and then also this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, subtype 7 isolates, and found out that uh, only the subtype 7 isolates 
can uh, disrupt the epithelial barrier, uh, producing um, uh, higher flux. Uh, and also, she uh, investigated the, uh, the uh, protein, um, protein in tight junctions, occludin and Z01, and then found out that um, uh, there is a degradation uh, of these uh, tight junction proteins when they are um, uh, co-incubated with, uh, with, the, um, with the lysates from uh, these subtype 7 isolates, but not in subtype 4 isolates. And these are the uh, confocal images. So as you can see, there is a degradation in this uh, subtype 7 isolate, uh, H, G, and C for the occludin, and then for uh, the Z01, uh, subtype 7 H, G, C, uh, B, and E, but not for uh, subtype 4 isolates. Again, um, um, again, um, suggesting that uh, subtype 7 isolates are potentially uh, pathogenic. Um, and in my own work as well, uh, because in my PhD uh, project, I was doing um, uh, a project on colonic antimicrobial peptides, uh, including LR37, so which is an element of the uh, innate Im immune response. And I found out that um, subtype 7B is uh, relatively resistant against this uh, antimicrobial peptide. And then, uh, not only that, uh, but this subtype 7B isolate uh, can produce or can secrete proteases that can de degrade LR37, which um, then when you apply this uh, LR37 with uh, uh, executory secretory products from the subtype 7B isolate, they become uh, inactivated and they're not functioning in uh, killing the, uh, the blastocystis. Uh, so this was a collaborative project, um, and uh, so the genome sequence of the stramenophile, uh, stramenophile uh, blastocystis, and uh, well, in this paper, uh, said that the, uh, this isolate has secretory proteins and virulence factors potentially involved in host interactions, which, uh, well, again, like, yeah, so these are uh, virulence factors. Uh, so that this, um, this uh, glycoside hydroly hydrolases uh, and other cysteine proteases. Okay, so basically, the the um, uh, my 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 project uh, is to uh, I mean this this uh, short project is to, to explore the interactions between blastocystis of the seven isolates and rep representatives of the gut microbiota. So I know that a lot of people are like, doing um, uh, sequencing and uh, um, well uh, massive uh, genome studies on um, on the microbiome as uh, affected by blastocystis, but uh, I just want this project to be a supplement to, to, those, uh, to those research. Um, so first, uh, what I did was to uh, uh, incubate blastocystis with the gut microbiota, so I chose uh, representatives of the gut microbiota, so these are the three setups, so I had the blastocystis in this tube, and then the blastocystis with the bacteria, and then just the bacteria. So I counted the blastocystis with uh, using hemocytometer, and then I counted the CFU per, per ml of uh, bacteria using uh, the pore plate uh, agar method. So, and then I found out that um, when you co-culture with uh, blastocystis sub subtype 7 isolates with uh, gut bacteria, you have, uh, in general, you have a higher count of blastocystis. And this is, um, is, 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 is probably not surprising because uh, this is in uh, PBS and the, probably the debris from the bacteria is used by blastocystis to grow or to, sur to survive longer. But then uh, when looking at the bacteria, so all the when you uh, co-incubate the bacteria with uh, uh, blastocystis subtype 7B and subtype 7H isolates, uh, in general, you also have a higher count of uh, bacteria, except uh, for Bifidobacterium longum. So we're in, uh, for subtype 7B isolate, you don't, have, you don't see any change, uh, but for subtype 7H, you even see a lower uh, CFU count. Uh, when you, um, well, uh, co-incubate this uh, Bifidobacterium longum with uh, blastocystis. So, um, and then I started uh, looking at what could be the possible mechanism. Uh, well, I didn't adhere, but, uh, you know, I, I, I did um, uh, phagocytosis uh, assay, but uh, it was, I didn't see any evidence of phagocytosis in, in, in uh, blastocystis. Uh, but, um, uh, but then here, I, ad I added another experiment. So instead of using one uh, representative of uh, gut uh, bacterium, so I used uh, uh, two bacteria, and then, I co-incubated it with uh, blastocystis. And uh, so I chose um, 
uh, E. coli and then Bifidobacterium longum. So the, the difference between the two of them is that Bifidobacterium longum is an obligate anaerobe while E. coli is uh, facultative uh, aerobe um, or uh, facultative anaerobe. Um, <clears throat> and then I found out that um, when you uh, co-incubate uh, E. coli with uh, Bifidobacterium longum and even with uh, Bifidobacterium longum plus subtype 7 B isolate and subtype, 7 uh, subtype 7 H isolates, you get a higher uh, CFU count. But then when you look at the Bifidobacterium longum, so it, it's the opposite. So you get a lower, lower count of Bifidobacterium longum when you, when you uh, co-incubated with uh, both E. coli and uh, blastocystis. And then the possible mechanism um, is, um, well, actually this is not like a, like a guess, but then I, I was reading some papers, and uh, I saw that uh, probably oxidative stress can play a role in, in, in this uh, dynamics, in, uh, in this representative of the gut microbiota and blastocystis. So what I did was, um, uh, so I again co-incubated the three of them, and then, uh, but uh, particularly for bifidobacterium longum, I stained with backlight red so that I can, um, when I do flow cytometry, I can, uh, uh, I can, I can gate for them. Uh, and then, um, so after combining all of them, then I stained with uh, DCFDA. So DCFDA is not a fluorescent um, uh, compound, but then when it is uh, exposed to a reactive, uh, reactive oxygen species, um, then it becomes fluorescent. So then that, that could be, um, uh, that can reflect the, the oxidative stress uh, that is, um, well, that, that, that can happen to the Bifidobacterium longum. And so then I did the uh, flow cytometer. So this is just the Bifidobacterium longum. So you can see that there is there's not a lot of cells uh, under uh, oxidative stress. Um, but then uh, when, you, uh, when you combine the Bifidobacterium longum with E. coli, so you get a higher uh, number of cells with uh, oxidative stress, but even more with, uh, with, uh, in the presence of uh, subtype 7B isolate, but then a little bit lower when, you, um, uh, when the, the E. coli is present. So, so actually this is the, uh, the summary of the, um, the, uh, the experiments I've, uh, I've done, so that uh, you see that uh, when you combine Bifidobacterium longum with uh, blastocystis subtype 7 B isolate, so there is a higher uh, oxidative stress. And um, I, uh, I also um, I also did uh, I also tried to analyze the gene expression of the oxidoreductases in Bifidobacterium longum because if they are uh, exposed to, to this uh, ROS, then uh, presumably the, the, in order to cope up with that stress, uh, they will increase the, um, uh, they will upregulate their um, oxidoreductases. And then I found out that uh, in some of them, uh, they are indeed uh, upregulated. So, um, okay, then aside from this oxidative stress, so what other uh, mechanism uh, could explain the, uh, the lower count of uh, Bifidobacterium longum when you um, co-incubated with uh, blastocystis and E. coli. So, um, and then I, here, here in this experiment, I was looking at the host responses. Um, so I did, uh, so what I did was uh, I generated the HG29 monolayer, and then uh, I put blastocystis, and then after uh, some time of incubation, I removed the blastocystis, so that means uh, this monolayer has been exposed to uh, to uh, blastocystis, and then I added the bifidobacterium longum, and then after some incubation, I determined the uh, bifidobacterium longum CFU per ml, and then I found out that um, uh, in those uh, monolayers exposed to exposed to uh, blastocystis, there is a lower count of uh, a lower count of bifidobacterium longum, and then with uh, um, double the number or double the cell density of uh, subtype seven B isolate, there is even uh, uh, lower. Mm, uh, Bifidobacterium longum uh, CFU per ml count. Uh, but how important is uh, Bifidobacterium longum in, uh, in, in the host? Um, and so, um, and, uh, so what I did was uh, I used a transwell, um, transwell insert, so I had this, um, uh, so this is a six-well uh, cell culture plate, and then I added uh, both blastocystis and Bifidobacterium longum, uh, Blastocystis alone or Bifidobacterium longum or uh, both. And then uh, in order to analyze or determine the disruption of the uh, epithelial barrier, so I use, uh, I use this um, to measure the, I, I measure the transepithelial electrical resistance. Uh, and also I use a dextran uh to look at the flux uh, of these uh, materials. And I found out that um, when you, so when there, there is a subtype 7B, so there is a lower trans, uh, elect, transepithelial electrical resistance, 
uh, meaning that uh, the epithelial barrier is being disrupted. Um, but then when it's combined with uh, uh, bifid of bacterium longum, so there is a sort of a rescue of the integrity of the epithelial barrier. So the same thing that you can see with, with the flux, so there is more uh, material passing through the epithelial barrier uh, when the monolayer is subjected to subtype 7B isolate, but then uh, there is, again, another rescue when uh, bifid of bacterium longum is present. Um, and then in order to uh, validate this, um, well, uh, in, in, in specifically the, the lower bifidobacterium longum count that I have seen in in vitro assays. So uh, we did uh, with our collaborators, we did the mouse work, and um, uh, so what we did was um, uh, we used a colitis model of uh, colitis mice model, mouse model, and then uh, um, by surgery inoculated it with uh, blastocystis. Um, so then we did the three things. Uh, we collected the, the fecal samples uh, and then the, did the qPCR uh, on them. And then these fecal samples we collected like four times. So like uh, before surgery, before putting the blastocystis, and then the, uh, one day after uh, uh, surgery, and then two days after surgery, and three days after surgery. So in, in, in fact, for each mice, uh, uh, for each mouse, we had uh, four fecal samples. Uh, and also, uh, so these are the, we also detected the presence of blastocystis via microscopy and PCR uh, after the, the surgery uh, and after the whole experiment. And then, uh, so after three days, we um, euthanized the mice and then harvest mouse colon and the cecum and then uh, did the histology. Um, so this is just the... This is just the, the summary of the, the microscopy we did. Uh, in fact, the control, which is not supposed to have any blastocystis, we found this uh, round structures here, which uh, pro well, look like uh, um, uh, blastocystis. But uh, when I did the PCR, so they were negative. So they were, um, I don't know, other debris and uh, I don't know, other organisms. But uh, these are indeed uh, uh, blastocystis here. Okay. Um, and then we did the histology. Uh, and then... Um, then there, there is, um, so histopathology shows tissue damage in experimentally infected mice, and blastocystis uh, subtype 7H had higher scores on pathology scoring, so as you can see uh, from here. Uh, but the most important um, uh, results in this, uh, in this study in relation to my project is, um, is that, uh, well, I found out that, you know, this is, um, so these are all normalized to before surgery, of the fecal samples, and then I found that the, in the terms of total bacteria, there's not much change in terms of the relative abundance of bacterial 16S RNA genes uh, per for 42 milligrams of feces. Uh, for bacteroides, there's again not, not much change, but then I look at the lactobacillus, um, there here at the day three uh, for subtype 7H, there is a uh, significant difference, so there's a lower, uh, lower abundance of lactobacillus at day three uh, when, the mice is, when the mouse is infected with uh, blastocystis subtype 7H isolate. But then the, the most important uh, part of my data is here uh, because I, I was doing experiment on bifidobacterium and then E. coli, and then I found out that, uh, so indeed, uh, day three, there is a, there is a decrease in uh, bifidobacterium longum uh, uh, 16S RNA genes, uh, and then, but E. coli, uh, you have this, um, you have this uh, higher abundance. Okay, um, so in summary, uh, in summary, so uh, this is the intestinal epithelial cell, so you have this uh, representative of the gut microbiota, and then you have the blastocystis subtype 7, uh, subtype 7 isolates. Um, so bifidobacterium longum, is beneficial to the intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, as we have seen, they, they maintain the uh, epithelial bare integrity. But then, uh, blastocystis uh, subtype 7H isolates can um, increase uh, the count of E. coli. Uh, and then, together with E. coli, they can, um, uh, they can expose bifidobacterium longum to oxidative stress. Uh, and then, also, blastocystis, blastocystis can. Um, interact with the intestinal epithelial cells, producing uh, host responses, and these host immune, innate immune responses are also, uh, can also um, be deleterious to bifidobacterium longum. And then, uh, well, uh, in, uh, also, there is a direct interaction with, between blastocystis, blastocystis and uh, bifidobacterium longum, uh, which again, uh, as you have seen in the first uh, experiment, uh, bifidobacterium longum had a lower uh, CFU count. Okay, and then, yeah, so the intestinal host response is um, negative, can negatively affect bifidobacterium longum. Okay, so, um, well, the, I've been discussing it with uh, 
Prof Tan, and they suggested that, yeah, so probably most of the subtypes, most of the isolates are beneficial to, to the microbiome in general because they increase the, um, uh, the diversity, but then uh, among the sheep, there is this, uh, there's this wolf, um, which is, uh, well, we have seen from the survey, this is actually rare. Uh, but then this um, rarity is, uh, is probably like, um, you know, this, this, partic uh, this particular uh, isolates uh, is probably uh, not good for the, for the microbiome. And so, um, yeah, so thank you for, uh, for listening. And then, uh, so these are the people who work on the, in the lab. So actually, it was started by Iran, uh, our um, undergraduate student uh, before. And then uh, Gyok Chu is the one who axonized uh, all of the isolates um, in, in the lab. And then uh, Jessin is the one who helped me with, uh, well, with some uh, flow cytometry. Uh, not in the picture, uh, it's from the Prof. Uh, Chang's uh, lab, uh, Chin Wen, who did the, the mouse work. So thank you very much. Questions? Thanks for this presentation. Um, related to Bifidobacterium and Subtype 7, do you think that that based on the data that is about microbiota and blastocystis. Yes, blastocystis career status and not careers. Do you think that that might be the same, you might have the same results for subtype 1, subtype 3, and subtype 4? You mean uh, that they will affect the bifidobacterium longum, yes. like also negatively? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, um, no. Uh, in fact, I just didn't add the, because it was too preliminary, but I also did uh, for other isolates, uh, subtype 1. Um, there was no, um, the, it was a different uh, scenario. So they didn't uh, decrease uh, bifidobacterium longum. Okay, but my question is more like, based on what is already reported about uh, mm -hmm. if bifidobacterium is in high frequency or low frequency, in blastocystis career versus no careers. Okay, um, so yeah, the, the problem is with those reports, uh, they didn't identify the subtype of the uh, blastocystis. Um, but uh, I, 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 so for example, I, I, there's, um, um, yeah, there's this, um, uh, there's this, uh, sorry, paper. Uh, see here, the, uh, this one, blastocystis is associated with decrease in protective gut bacteria and colonization may lead to dysbiosis. In fact, this, this one uh, is bifidobacterium significantly decrease in blastocystis positive males, but uh, we didn't, um, they didn't identify the, the subtype here. Um, so, um, I don't know. So, <laughs> this is probably subtype 7 or uh, other subtypes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, good morning. Oh, sorry. Good morning to everybody, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, the scientific committee of this uh, interesting congress to uh, give me the opportunity to show you the, uh, my uh, results on the molecular epidemiology of blastocystis in Italy. Well, so, no. Oh, okay. We have about 7% of the prevalence of this protist in Italy, but we don't have so much study uh, published on this topic and a few records from hospitals, uh, as well as a few records from hospitals. So uh, this is the first study published on blastocystis in Italy. Uh, was done by, by, by the group of uh, Professor Viscoliosis. And they, uh, uh, fi uh, they find about uh, six uh, subtypes in 30 symptomatic patients. They uh, found the, the subtype 3, the 2, 4, 1, uh, 7, and uh, 8 with the different uh, prevalent value. And uh, um, <coughs> this is uh, our second study and uh, was uh, by us performed in Italy. Uh, in order to study the subtype distributions from a large number of uh, human fecal samples, we uh, collected about uh, 200 samples from patients with symptoms and without uh, symptoms, and, order, and, and also to, uh, so to study the variability, the genetic variability within the same subtypes. 
So uh, uh, we uh, find uh, we found uh, uh, six subtypes too, and uh, uh, with the similar uh, prevalence and uh, the, the, to the study previously uh, reported. But in addition, we find we found also the the subtype six, and uh, we uh, found this. Uh, some significant uh, uh, correlation within the, the symptoms and uh, the subtype uh, uh, 2, 3, and 4. In particular, we found the uh, 4 uh, associated with the IBS. So, uh, in contrast uh, when, well, with the, uh, the results uh, previously uh, reported in the, this room this morning. So, but very interesting results we have when we consider the, the genetic variability within the same subtypes, because we found 20 haplotypes, and we, find, we found uh, eight haplotypes in the subtype one, four in the two, and three in the subtype three, with the different frequencies. And this uh, um, high genetic variability that we found in these two subtypes uh, reflect the low host specificity that we have when we compare uh, our isolates with the isolates from gene bank. In fact, we have these two subtypes that uh, clustered with the isolates from animal isolates, while the isolates from the subtype 2 clustered in, uh, with other human isolates, and uh, those from the four subtypes with the, with the mouse. So it's also very interesting, this cloud, because we have the subtype 6 and the 7 that would cluster with the, uh, animal isolates from birds from chickens. So this is very interesting because underlying the uh, this, this, uh, zoonotic uh, subtypes in Italy. So uh, everybody here in this room knows this uh, question and uh, our common idea that the answer uh, depends from the different variables, including the study of the microbiota. So, of course, there are a lot of studies that support the hypothesis that the blastocystis is associated with the health microbiota, and uh, we move to study the fecal, mag fecal microbiota composition from two cohorts of patients, immunocompromised patients affected by HIV, and immunocompetent uh, patients that uh, were referred to our uh, university hospital. And uh, those are our methods. We uh, screened our samples uh, with the parasitological and, of course, molecular methods uh, to, uh, to detect the uh, subtypes and also uh, to, uh, to, to have data about uh, the microbiota compositions of these, uh, of these patients uh, by using the NGS. So we have uh, about 20% of the immunocompromised subjects uh, positive to plasticisis and only 7% of the, uh, the immunocompetent uh, person affected by, by this protein, maybe, but we, all, mm, you know, we screen at this uh, on, only with the microscopic analysis. So about the, the subtypes, we have uh, the same subtypes, uh, more or less the same subtypes that we previously found found in the, the, in the previous work, and uh, we find in this survey also the, the DST7. So, uh, but this high prevalence that we found in the uh, immunocom immunocompromised persons uh, doesn't reflect the uh, immunological status or virological status of these patients. In fact, we don't have a significant association between the CD4 count, uh, the present of absence of the, of the blastocystis, so, uh, uh, also uh, with the, 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 the treatment or not. We have only a positive association with in the low BMI uh, and uh, the presence of uh, blastocystis and uh, for the, the symptoms we have only the flautulants that score uh, significant. So about the microbiota compositions, we perform our first pilot study on only 12 uh, persons, 12 subjects, all males or uh, 40 years old uh, in order to, to limit the, the vari variables and all uh, uh, the blastopositive for the uh, subtype 3. 
And uh, uh, according to the literature, we have uh, uh, a different situation in the case of the control versus uh, the blastus carrier that uh, show the typical uh, profile with uh, the, uh, the high uh, abundance of uh, pregotella, while the control showed uh, the enterococcus uh, enterotype. So, uh, uh, in order to confirm these results, we uh, screened more subjects with the same uh, characteristics, and uh, we have the uh, high uh, abundance, high richness, high bacteria richness in blasto carriers versus, versus the, the, the free ones. And uh, with the Prevotella uh, as the, ma the major uh, bacteria species, while in the free we have uh, Bacteroides uh, was the most prevalent. So uh, regarding the comparison of these two groups of uh, patients, we have uh, uh, the similar bacteria species uh, in the two groups, uh, reflecting the, the, the results. And, uh, uh, but uh, the, the monocompetent person show uh, a little bit more uh, bacteria richness, uh, higher than the, uh, the monocompromised person. So uh, our preliminary consideration are online with the, uh, the results previously uh, uh, showed by, by, by other groups, that are important groups, so suggesting that the colonization by blastocysts would be linked to uh, an healthy gut microbiota. But we study only the microbiota composition in the case of the ST3, but uh, what about the other subtypes? So we need more samples from, from other subtypes in in order to characterize the microbiota, also in the case of these subjects. And what we have in the case of other immunological disease, so we need to, to screen other population of patients in order to compare their uh, microbiota composition. In fact, we are now uh, studying a population of uh, patients affected by Lyme disease, and we will to compare the, the two studies. So, uh, also, we want to study more in deep the therapeutic role of blastocysts in the case of uh, fecal microbiota transplantation, because I am uh, in, uh, in a group that screened uh, the samples for this, uh, for this method. So, so, this question is still open, of course, and uh, we move to the subtypes again because there are no study in Italy about the, the rule of the animal source of uh, infections uh, for humans, and uh, in collaboration with uh, veterinarians from other two universities, from Naples and Messina, we collected samples from farm and animals and pets, and uh, we characterized uh, the subtypes as uh, uh, preliminary results. In fact, for the water buffaloes, I obtained the, the results only Monday. So this is uh, just uh, alignment uh, by blast. As, uh, I have to revise this, uh, this result. But for the other isolates, we uh, compare our sequence with the those from gene bank, and we have the subtype 7 and 6 in, uh, uh, that we find in, uh, in the hands, in chicken, and uh, we find uh, um, a new, maybe, I don't know, but we have to, to, to study more in deep this uh, new subtypes in peacock, and the subtype uh, 5 in, uh, in pigs, uh, and also the, the 8 in peacocks too. So this is the, our final analysis, comparing all the, the sequence, all the isolates uh, by us obtained from humans and from animal two, and we uh, find the subtype one, two, three only in uh, humans, uh, even if with different haplotypes. But it's very interesting that we have the sequence from animals very close uh, with the sequence from, from humans, emphasizing the risk for zoonotic transmission through, uh, through animal handling. So, for example, to the, to the, also the, the manipulation of the eggs of uh, the thing. So, this is a very interesting uh, results. 
Vertis is the final network, and uh, again, we have uh, uh, an high generative variability in the case of the, sub, the subtype 1, 2, and 3, with uh, different haplotypes with different frequencies. But uh, also in the case of the animals, we have different haplotypes, but we, are, uh, we must to, uh, collect more samples to, uh, to confirm uh, this, uh, this network for the animals. But for the humans, we have different. Uh, Haplotypes. So why we have these haplotypes? Also, also in the case of uh, of the of the ST3 that we found only in in, in humans. So uh, maybe the the these genetic variability is related to the immune response. Uh, this, uh, um, maybe yes, we don't know. But oh, maybe um, to the geographical origin of the subjects of the for the to their travel history. Maybe maybe yes, but we don't know any data. From, from, from our patients about this, um, this uh, topic. So, uh, which is the rule of these haplotypes in, uh, uh, in uh, the um, pathogenicity of, uh, of blastocysts? This is, this is very interesting. So we, we think that we must to improve the, the genetic study on, uh, on this topic in order to, have, uh, to try to have an answer to the, to the famous question. Uh, so, uh, in, the, in the future, we would like to study also the variability of genes involved in the colonizations. And also, we want to increase uh, the, uh, our animal samples in order to assess the pathways of zoonotic transmission to human, to human in Italy. So, uh, so, I am only here, but if I want to know more and more. This is the reason why we, I am here today, to, uh, to learn more from you. And, uh, Special thanks for my collaboration, from my collaborators from the uh, Veterinarian Water University. And uh, last picture for my beautiful city, uh, <laughs> of course. I think that uh, maybe Rome is, is a perfect place for the next uh, Congress, maybe. Yes, this is my opinion. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Simona. Uh, questions? I, maybe I'll start us off. Um, so that was really interesting. I, I, I didn't quite get the take-home message about the immunocompromised results versus the, the healthy results and the impact on the microbiome. Could you, what's the take-home message? Yes, between my, those two groups. Yes, in my opinion, it's very difficult to compare these two cohorts of patients. They are too different. Because in the monocompromision to HIV patients, you have a lot of factors that interact. So the situation is very uh, is, is difficult, but they have also a, 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 an immunological status good. They feel, well, uh, they are similar to health people, because we, we screen at this population also for the alter, uh, other uh, opportunistic uh, uh, parasitic disease, so for example, Toxoplasma, Leishmania, and Crypto, they, uh, was, uh, they were negative to these uh, parasites. So I think that we compare similar population, even if in the case of uh, the HIV uh, patients, we have a lot of factors that interact, including the therapy, including maybe the, the probiotic assumption, maybe yes, and they influence the high prevalence that we have uh, observed in this, uh, in this cohort of patients. So difficult to get conclusions from that because of that, yeah. Because, from the, because of the variability of the, all the people undergoing treatment. And yeah. Yeah. Yes. Other questions for Simona? Okay. Uh, well, so, I think thank you. we. Uh, oh, sorry. I'll give you this. Thank you so much for your research. You are very nice, and you have done a lot of work in that. Yeah. Thank you. And I mean, it's not just, it's not a question, it's just a congratulation for all your work. It's oh, very, you. very interesting. Thank so. you. I must do, we, I have to cut a lot of the results because we have only 15 minutes, but, uh, and uh, we, are, we want to, to publish uh, the, these results maybe in the, in the special issue that you propose us. So maybe it was more complete results. Ah, we do have questions. 
Congratulations, Simona. Thank you. For your work and for your whole team. But I, I, maybe I did not understood or I did not hear well. Did all patients were under treatment or did you check all the viral charge of all the patients? Uh, almost uh, all, all the patients are on treatment. Sorry? Yes, are, are on treatment. Yes, we are only three or four naive before the treatment. Under yes. anti antiviral retral yes. treatment? Yes, the heart treatment, yes. The heart treatment. Yes. Um, and so it means that the, the regular, the, the, the count were very low yeah. of viral replication. Yeah, yes. Was very low. Maybe I showed it in the table. Ah, okay. And also, they have a high level of CD4. Oh, CD4, so. but not. The, did you not measure the? Did you not put the, the, the viral charge? Yeah, no. Uh, ah, okay. Yes, because they are in, on uh, an art therapy. We have only the, the data from the three naive patients. So it's not too much. Mm, yes, I understand. Yes, yes. It's not, it's not because easier. Because in, yeah. in our hospital, we uh, enrolled only uh, in patients in treatment. Yes, in other hospitals, for example, Spallanzani Hospital, uh, they have uh, more naive, without treatment, yes. subjects. Okay. So we screen only the, the person already uh, treated. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Simon. <coughs> Lovely talk. Um, just one question about this uh, potentially new subtype from the peacock. Did you see it in one peacock, or did you, did you see it in multiple peacocks? Yeah, two, pe two peacocks. Two peacocks. Yes. So you got you got the 600 base pairs for now, or yes. do you have, do you, did you sequence more? No, we sequence only the Shakiluna. Do you plan to? Yeah, to yeah I, I plan to. Wow. Yes, yes. Well, uh, so about the animal screening, we tested uh, first the samples using the scenting region, mm -hmm, yeah. and then we tested all the positive with the barcoding okay. region. Okay, yes, cool, cool, cool. Too. Yeah, yeah. So because with uh, with only the barcoding, we have a lot of fundi yeah. amplification, so we decide to to screen before with the. Uh, with the primates proposed by Santin, mm -hmm. and then with the barcoding region. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll move on to uh, uh, Justin Hamilton, who's going to tell us about uh, um, wild chimpanzees and the not-so-friendly old friends hypothesis. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me and allowing me to share this work. And a very special thanks to Rune and Raul for giving such good introductions about what can be understood and the potential and also the caveats of microbiome studies. I think they're going to be very useful to, as a context to understand these results. So this work is uh, called Exploring the Interactions Between Blastocystis, Other Intestinal Parasites, and the Gut Microbiomes of Wild Chimpanzees and it was conducted in, in Senegal. So the research question is what patterns do we see, what interactions do we see between the gut microbiota and the presence of, of blastocystis? But more so, are these patterns similar to the patterns that we find in humans? Because the chimpanzee microbiome is very similar to the human microbiome, at least non-Western human microbiome. And finally, what additional value, what extra uh, information can we get out of studying wild animals, if not also animal models, but especially wild animals? So as I mentioned, it was conducted in the southeast tip in Senegal, in the reserve, natural reserve uh, of Dindefelo. And in this reserve, there are also human populations. So the chimpanzees are absolutely wild, but they share water streams and they share a lot of habitat with the humans. So this is something to keep in mind during the, the talk. So we sampled over 90 fecal samples, 82 of which we successfully amplified. And in these, we did paired end Illumina amplicon sequencing of the V3, V4 region to understand the microbiome. And the parasites were detected with several PCR methods. Uh, blastocystis was detected uh, through SSU PCR uh, in David and, and Pamela in Madrid. So what did we find? So we found blastocystis. Uh, we found 30 positive samples for blastocystis, 10 for strongyloides, a single giardia, and three tetratrichomonas species. 
but also, and then the, so the subtype distribution of these of the blastocystis uh, isolates were mostly ST1 and mostly LL8, but we also found LL9 and uh, ST3, in addition to some that were untypable. We also checked for other parasites because confounding factors when we talk about blastocystis and coparasitism is a very important thing. So we didn't check for amoeboid parasites, but we did check for these and we did not find them. So the first thing that I want to share, this is a rarefaction plot that captures how much of the diversity you get uh, as, as more sequences accumulate. So this plot shows that we capture most of the microbial diversity, which is a very important thing to validate microbiome studies. So we found a decrease in the microbial richness, in the prokaryote richness, in the blastocystis colonized uh, chimpanzees. So this is on the contrary of many of the human studies that associated with a, an increase of this diversity. This was very interesting to me. Significant differences and I'm going to use tronchiloides all throughout the talk as a kind of a control to show that these patterns are specific to blastocystis and not necessarily for all parasites. So as we see here, tronchiloides was, did not have uh, a difference in the prokaryote diversity. Beta diversity. Beta diversity, as has been, as probably many of you know, is a, a, a unit, is a, is a measurement of the difference in diversity from one sample to the next. So to understand the variation, the changes in the microbiome, uh, we looked at how much of this variation was explained by blastocystis and stenochiloides, and they're both significant. However, they explain relatively little of this variance. Other factors that explained uh, the variance were the diet and the geographic location, which is very common in, in microbiome studies. And in total, with these factors, we only, well, only, we uh, managed to explain 15% of the, of the variance. So this, again, is the beta diversity plot. As, an, uh, as Raul mentioned, uh, these plots show how similar the microbial communities in two samples are. Uh, and what these plots do is they take all the variability in your data and they try to crunch it into a low number of dimensions. So here we have, in this case, we have three dimensions. We have first dimension over here, second dimension here and here, and the third dimension. So we see that if we twist this plot around in, 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 in from a certain angle, we can see that blastocystis, which are the blue uh, dots, only are present in some kinds of communities, but are mostly absent in others, right? And if we look further, so here we have a, a, an alpha diversity index once again, with a yellow being low diversity, and we found that these patterns uh, match very well. So once again, we found the blastocystis present in communities with relatively low bacterial and uh, archaeal diversity. So once again, this pattern does not happen if we look at stronchiloides, right? So enterotypes have been presented previously by a uh, by Rune, and uh, we have these uh, three kinds dominated by Bacteroides, Prebotella, and Ruminococcus, and as you know, it's found in two of these, but uh, hardly found in the Bacteroides enterotype. Results which we managed to replicate. So we found it, uh, we found an increase in the Prebotella abundance in Blastocystis positive samples, the same for Methanobrevibacter that belongs to the Ruminococcus enterotype, and although no, non-significant, uh, a trend, uh, a negative trend between bacteroides and blastocystis presence. So the next thing is uh, with these taxa here, um, my interpretation of these taxa and the, the differential abundance between blastocystis positive and negative samples is that they, we see in blastocystis uh, positive samples an increase of certain anaerobic taxa. Um, and some of these, which correlate in turn with a longer gut passage time, such as Selenomonadals and Methanobrevibacter. Additionally, we see a decrease in some of the known gut protective bacteria, 
which again is very interesting to me because it challenges this notion that we have find a healthier gut microbiome in our blastocystic positive patients. And once again, remind you that the alpha diversity is an indicator, an indicator of health and we found a lower alpha diversity in the blastocystis positive samples. So finally, just to show that, uh, that we have a, an opposite trend in the stronghyloides when it comes to bacteroides or the bacteroidaceae group, we don't see the alpha diversity trend and it gets associated to different taxa than blastocystis gets associated to. So to approach the second question, does this data match what we see in humans? So I'm going to use this uh, table that was used already twice in the previous talks, uh, summarized by Rune. Uh, and when we're talking about speci specific taxa, we do find that they agree, that the chimpanzee and the human data agree. We're speaking about methanoberibacter, bacteroides, and the enterotypes. However, when we start speaking about bacterial diversity, they do not agree, as I've already shown. And in some taxa, I was, this data set does not replicate what we see in humans. So this uh, study by the, by the Italian group that includes over 2,000 studies, which by the way did not manage to replicate the association between the richness and blastocystis, uh, I'm going to show this plot, which they show the, the most highly positive and negatively correlated taxa with blastocystis, and on this I'm going to overimpose which of these taxa uh, are also uh, in, we find the same pattern when we look at the chimpanzee data. So we can see that overall many of these, so only some of them significantly, but many of these show the same trend as we see in humans. And there was one disagreement, but we have a, we only detected Fecalibacterium in six or seven samples. They were all blastocystis negative, but because we only detected it in so little samples, I wouldn't trust this result so much, although it's significant. So what does all this mean? So we get blastocystis associated to certain, but not all, microbial communities. These microbial communities in chimpanzees and in humans are associated to certain enterotypes, and in chimpanzees to a lower diversity too. And we have the question that also Rune uh, presented before, is it what direction does this uh, have? Is it blastocystis inducing a change in the community or is it the community avoiding colonization by blastocystis? In my opinion, it's both. But we really need to go beyond associational studies to understand this animal models would be my choice. And we see similar patterns as we see in humans. Um, so these characteristics, as I mentioned, uh, are decreased bacterial richness in chimpanzees, uh, less gut protective microbes, and more anaerobic taxa, which in turn could be linked to an increased gut passage time. But what of the contradictions? How can we explain this contradiction between the increased uh, bacterial diversity that we see associated to blastocystis in humans and the opposite pattern that we found in chimpanzees? So the first option is that uh, blastocystis has this amazing diversity and also in virulence as was, has been shown all throughout the conference. So this would, might be one option to explain the differences. Polyparasitism of undetected, unchecked parasites might be a very important confounding factor when we're studying these associations. There are differences, they're very similar, but there are differences between the two microbiomes, so that could also be one possible explanation for the difference in the patterns. And uh, we're doing future research, but we could not establish uh, clearly uh, the origin of these subtypes in, in chimpanzees. We do not know if they came from humans, and if they did so, how long ago this happened. And as you might know, uh, when a parasite uh, or a pathogen jumps host, usually that we find more disequilibrium, if not also more virulence. The reminder of the map. And finally, which is very important to me, in many of the human studies that associate bacterial richness to, to diversity, they include cohorts with highly, highly aberrant and oxic uh, gut microbiomes. So this could lead uh, these uh, microbiomes with a uh, pro-inflammatory environment 
could be absent for blastocystis, and at the same time, they have a low prokaryotic diversity. So in my mind, this is a very important confounding factor that we should try to avoid in future associational studies, if not go to animal models. Um, so to sum up, um, I think it's very important that we broaden our mind and we start studying other hosts. Our gut microbiome has changed very much in, in recent years uh, in the, the process of westernization, changes of diet, increased hygiene, and so on. So we should look at not only non-Western populations, but also other similar and related species to understand what's going on and what role does, does blastocystis play in the gut environment. So, and with this, we might uh, avoid obscure or not so obscure confounding factors. We might give uh, an extra robustness to the associations that we see between the gut microbiome and blastocystis presence. And um, they provide other scenarios, other experiments, if you like, um, in which to see if, if these patterns are maintained or not and to further, further understand uh, these associations. So a big thanks uh, to all the collaborators in Barcelona, in Madrid, in Senegal, and recently also in Copenhagen. And I would like to share a photo of the Senegalese dome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Justin. That was really nice. Questions for Justin? So thank you very, very much uh, for your talk. This was really, really inspiring and um, love your work. Please do this for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, could this be a subtype one specific thing? thing? That's my first question. And another question is, uh, you looked at some of the gut protective bacteria, but how about something about acamantia, for instance? Uh, did you also, do chimpanzees have that and did you test? In this study, I wouldn't generalize to conclude that Ackermansia is not found in chimpanzees, okay. but in this data set, there's hardly any Ackermansia. Okay, okay. So that could be one of the yeah. differences between okay. the human and the... Yeah. And about the subtypes, mm -hmm. as you saw the sample size, we didn't have enough power yeah. to, to yeah. statistically understand the differences. Cool. Thank you very much. Justin, that was a really nice uh, presentation. So. Uh, related with what Rung was asking, so he was asking about agramancia, and you say that um, maybe there were some issues during sample collection, do you think, or maybe it was a storage conditions? Because another thing that your data doesn't show is fecalobacterium, no? Uh, so we do detect it, mm -hmm. but only in six or seven samples, as I mentioned. But this kind of um, thing is that that's a strict an anaerobe. Um, well, I guess... So, what, when, yeah, finish. When you collect the samples, so they were fresh or any idea about when the sample le left the body? So, um, we were collecting these samples in the fi uh, with field guides that have ample experience with these kinds of, of samples. And um, <clears throat> they were all collected uh, after less than 24 hours after uh, the, the chimpanzees had left them there. And uh, so we did an estimation. We collected data on the estimation according to how dry they were. So we tried to estimate how long ago uh, this, or how long the sample had been on the ground before we collected it. And I ran the correlations between the, the time and the diversity and, and specific taxa, and I hardly found any association. And also there are some studies that show that, um, that leaving the, the fecal contact untouched in its own matrix is one of the ways to best preserve and least affect and change the community. And in the, in the fecal samples, we tried to collect fecal samples with abundant matter, and we tried to go to the center of those. So we try to avoid the oxygen and also uh, other environmental taxa contaminating our samples. Okay, thanks. Anything else? <laughs> um, do you think that maybe the reason uh, that there is this uh, inconsistency about diversity 
between humans and your samples can be explained that because in chimps there are more strain level variation in bacteria and archaea? I hadn't thought about that. <clears throat> My, I, what I think is that uh, the human gut ecosystem is changing so much and we have such disparity of, of uh, ecosystems and members and we have very oxic, very stressed, very aberrant uh, ecosystems in the human populations. And I, I, I don't think that the chimpanzees are going to be obese, have IBS, IBD, and, and these very distinct or, yeah, distinct gut uh, communities. So that, that's what I think about the, the alpha diversity is, is essentially this, that in humans we see that in these very different and mostly oxic uh, environments we lose blastocystis and we lose microbial diversity leading to a spurious correlation. Okay, well thank you very much and thank all the speakers for this uh, session, for a great session. And now we move from the wild in Senegal into the clinical microbiology laboratory. Um, and we do that accompanied by Funda Dogroman L from Ghazi University in Ankara Medical Faculty, Professor Dogroman L. Um, and the title of her talk is Blastocystis in Clinical Microbiology, Advantages and Disadvantages of Methods Used in Diagnosis. What can we do for standardization? Hi, everybody. Uh, my talk title is so long, but uh, I try to be fast uh, before lunch. And the, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Johan Tevit uh, and uh, his excellent team, students, uh, University, uh, Rosario University, and all sponsors uh, for their uh, great uh, effort uh, to organize this uh, excellent uh, conference. And I am so uh, glad to be here. Uh, I'm uh, so happy uh, to be here with you and I would like to thank all of you for your coming, for your particip uh, participant and uh, for your uh, excellent uh, contributions to all uh, talks. Uh, and uh, we started uh, Blastocystis Conference in Turkey 2015. And uh, when I visit uh, Rune uh, 2013, uh, uh, first time I uh, told him uh, about my dream. I would like to organize one of conference, Rune. How about you? Can I do that? Oh, he said, yes, Funda, please and please, can you help me, Rune? Every time. So, thank you, Rune, uh, many times. Uh, and uh, we have many different memories from the first symposium. Uh, it is uh, held in my university in Ankara. And uh, we have also uh, many uh, nice people in there, uh, but uh, unfortunately, how can I say, uh, I don't know, but I'm so sorry uh, because uh, uh, one of uh, invited speakers in, uh, in that our symposium, Yavet Yakub, uh, he is from Aga Khan University uh, from Pakistan. Unfortunately, he passed away last year, uh, February 7. Uh, we miss him so much because he has many publications also about uh, clinical manifestation of blastocystis. I am glad to meet him so much because he is a very nice person. And uh, this loss uh, is so important for our blastocystis community. And. Uh, I hope uh, him, I hope to him rest in peace. Yes. 
And I'm a clinical microbiologist, so I work in mm -hmm. uh, I work in a hospital, uh, a big hospital in Ankara, capital city of Turkey. More than eight uh, uh, bed uh, capacity, and the, every day a couple of uh, thousand people admitted to our hospital. So uh, every time we need a rapid reliable, accurate, reproducible diagnosis for our patients. And also, uh, we need to help uh, to uh, our clinician for their treatments, for our patients' treatments. And uh, this is a re uh, general rule. Uh, and in term of blastocystis, uh, we uh, talk about for uh, three days, uh, uh, blastocystis uh, has a different potential uh, capacity. Uh, we don't know it is uh, real morbidity or uh, real prevalence around the world. Uh, we know uh, maybe uh, he, blastocystis has high morbidity, but we don't know any uh, mortality until now. And uh, blastocystis cause uh, colonization or real infectious agents. And uh, we need also epidemiological data uh, about blastocystis uh, prevalence. Uh, different region part of the world, uh, including human, animal, from water supply, and environment. So maybe human uh, studies are more common than the animals, but we need also uh, water supplies, uh, data from environment uh, to know real epidemiology of the blastocystis. We need all for because the uh, clarify of transmission route of blastocystis. And we have a many questions because when we report blastocystis to uh, clinicians, they uh, call us and uh, uh, they call uh, us and uh, they have always the same question. Uh, what is this? And the beast, uh, when we explain and then uh, always they say, uh, according to especially gastroenterologists, uh, they say the uh, same. Uh, according to our textbook, blastocystis is not an uh, important uh, thing. It is nothing. Maybe it is commercial. So we don't know. Uh, and my answer always, I don't know really. I don't know. Uh, so we need more studies to clarify relationship blastocystis and symptomatology or commensalism or it is an opportunistic agent and we need to clarify bila uh, relationship blastocystis and uh, blastocystis ST and the uh, symptomatology or intra subtype variation and symptomatology and we need also uh, more clear information about the pathogenicity of blastocystis. Because in some cases, uh, the real cases, when we uh, detect uh, a lot of uh, uh, color form in the DRL SOTO sample, when we report this, if uh, we detect, uh, if we uh, don't detect any other bacterial viruses or uh, parasite, uh, para, uh, parasites, clinicians prefer to give treatment, metronidazole as a first step uh, drug. And uh, about post-treatment uh, follow-up, we need also uh, to diagnose uh, blastocystis is present or absent, is there any cure, both clinical and parasit uh, parasitological. So it is also so important treatment efficacy. And we need uh, diagnosis at this, at this point. So also, uh, 
it is so nice uh, to uh, show the uh, many different microbiome studies in this conference. And uh, uh, I think by the time, according to accumulating literature knowledge, we will explain some uh, effects of blastocystis in our uh, uh, intestinal microbiota or in our health uh, status. So we need also uh, more information uh, about this uh, interaction, clarify this interaction. So also, uh, we talk about many times, there are many different uh, studies and there are many different data. And uh, we need confirmation sometimes uh, for this data. But uh, for this, we need also methods, especially standard methods. In the first step, uh, for uh, all studies uh, or uh, in hospital for diagnosis laboratories, we need stool collection. It is so basic uh, step, but it is first one of the first important step. And uh, all these process during this process, uh, uh, it is so important points also. For example which container use can be used, and then which storage uh, con uh, conditions uh, can be used. Uh, for example, it is so important equal collection between case control groups in the same weeks. In some studies, uh, researchers uh, especially try to collect stool samples in the uh, first term of the study. When they finish the collecting uh, stool samples from the patients, they started to control groups or healthy groups. So different uh, season, different stool samples, and uh, it is challenging for this uh, uh, collection. So it is also wrong. Uh, we uh, have to use at the same time, at the same week, uh, so to sample collection. And uh, for the researchers, especially sex and age matches uh, also so important point uh, between the case and control groups. So usage for the same extraction amplification methods, kits and equipment during the research should be same. And uh, after uh, collection and the, uh, after DNA extraction, also uh, all this material uh, storage, same conditions. In routine diagnosti diagnostic laboratories, we start the patient history and the, we have many uh, questionnaire or we need all this uh, information. And the, uh, also we clarify stool microscopy, stool uh, microscopy, and uh, the basic method of is the stool microscopy also, a wet mount uh, first step, and in uh, some laboratory, uh, they have a chance to using trichrome staining. And culture, it should be done especially in routine laboratories. Uh, it is so simple, and the, we need only two milliliter medium, and uh, we can available every supplement in available in many laboratories, so we can prepare so easily. Then, if a laboratory uh, have real time PCR it is also a uh, good option for the diagnosis. Um, in a microscopic examination should be done every time with uh, wet mount, uh, because the, we detected, uh, we can detect also another protozoan structures, uh, cyst and trophozoid and helminth egg or larva. 
And then we can use native uh, Lugos EODIT, Lugos solution, because sometimes uh, we can confuse blastocystis structure with the other uh, structures like that uh, leukocytes or debris or yeast. And so uh, Lugos uh, EODIT uh, can be uh, can help us easily. We uh, sorry, we are. Uh, when we uh, make uh, staining, we uh, uh, around we can see around the uh, vascular uh, central body. We can see uh, so bright peripheral rim as a stoplasma. So it, uh, we can uh, detect easily. And uh, uh, blastocyst, we know blastocyst is uh, anaerobic bacteria. Uh, anaerobic pro protein. So uh, sampling is so important. We uh, immerse our swab in deep as soon as as much as, uh, and the, uh, if we uh, if the uh, stool is uh, unformed stool, also we try to take stool samples in deep of the container. And uh, trichrome staining uh, is, uh, if a laboratory have a chance to use trichrome staining, is a, a good uh, choice for diagnosis. But uh, we can find many different modi modifications in uh, <coughs> the books or literature. And for example, the first step is Sheldon fixation step. Uh, when uh, the Sheldon fixa uh, fixate is uh, preparing, some laboratory prefer mercury chloride, but it is so uh, toxic. And some of them use uh, or prefer copper sulfate. And uh, some uh, in some modification uh, we can see uh, EODIT uh, step, but some of them uh, they don't uh, this EODIT. Uh, we need uh, experience uh, take a long time if uh, the uh, laboratory uh, patients load high it is not practical and. Uh, we need many different supplements, so uh, we, the preparation of the staining sand uh, sometimes is too long. But we know uh, how, uh, it is uh, not convenient only one stool sample uh, to examine and to, uh, uh, to report uh, negative or uh, negative. Because we need uh, many samples and the uh, according to this uh, graphic, we can see uh, if we uh, can collect up to six different uh, samples from same uh, patients. The, and we use on uh, also uh, trichrome staining uh, our uh, microscopic sensitivity uh, in, uh, increase. But uh, every time we cannot uh, do that because uh, maybe we suggest it to clinician, uh, but uh, we, we mostly only one time uh, from each patient. And um, one of questionnaire, uh, this is the, this is the uh, one of questionnaires in my country. The head of parasitology uh, study group uh, uh, made this questionnaire uh, in my country. She sent uh, this uh, questionnaire many different laboratories, including research and training hospitals and university hospitals. So. Uh, in all uh, hospitals, use direct preparation uh, saline, or uh, sometimes they use or not use iodine staining, a uh, hundred percent. But only university hospitals, not all, uh, some of them, nearly sixty percent, uh, use trichrome staining. And uh, we say that uh, microscopy uh, it should be done uh, to detect it uh, or identify another uh, 
parasite structures. But uh, we know no consensus on the importance of the cell numbers and various morphological forms. Because uh, especially in the past, uh, some laboratories report uh, dependent uh, number or some of them uh, report dependent number. So uh, there was very real, uh, real difference between the laboratories, uh, even same laboratories. And microscopy cannot distinguish genetically distinct uh, subtypes. And uh, if laboratory use only fecal concentrates, uh, maybe low sensitivity. Because uh, in my experience, always we, uh, if we have a chance uh, in the hospital from the patients, when we uh, take two samples first, uh, we use it for uh, fresh preparation, wet mount, and then if we make fecal uh, concentrations, then uh, check uh, this, uh, but only fecal concentrations. Sometimes um, we get negative, uh, false negative results. And microscopy need technical experts uh, and laborers uh, when infection is especially low levels, it is also insensitive. And uh, quantity of blastocystis, uh, Stenzel and uh, Bram uh, suggested in the past uh, more than five, if you detect more than five blastocystis in per uh, microscopic field, you can report. Uh, but according to another textbook uh, uh, by published Garcia, uh, it should be uh, report every time by please uh, make quantitation like few, moderate and many. But according to some uh, reports, these uh, quantitations is not uh, important uh, for especially uh, treatment criteria or uh, they have low diagnostic value. So uh, I use um, every time, especially in my research uh, culture, so I, have, I had many uh, negative uh, microscopy uh, results uh, for blastocystis, but when I use culture, and the, I get high abundance results or positive results from uh, real-time PCR. And uh, culture is so easy. And uh, first workshop day, we talk about the culture so uh, much. And uh, it is blastocystis, we have lucky because blastocystis is the most easiest parasite to cultivate in vitro. And casenic uh, cultivation can be used, uh, even should be used for diagnosis. Uh, it, Jones medium is the most common medium. Uh, and the, uh, according to some uh, uh, papers, uh, comp uh, comparative uh, results, uh, Jones medium uh, high uh, sensitivity. Another medium is uh, Ringer solution, or a new uh, name is Tanabachiba medium. Uh, both of them uh, has needed 10% uh, of horse serum. And we talk that uh, I always use, use inactivated horse serum, but Rodolfo suggests uh, it, uh, we, that we uh, not need inactivation. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can try. And uh, we need also um, two milliliter Pandorf tubes. And the, when we use this month, uh, also it is so cost effective. And the uh, supplements of both these mediums uh, find easily uh, every, I think every laboratory use like that PBS solution or some buffer solution. So uh, it can be uh, prepared using by uh, this solution. So it is 
the culture is simple, low cost, and uh, only two days uh, you can uh, report uh, after two days, especially in routine laboratories. And uh, Robinson medium or LISS GM medium can be used if you have get uh, or needed uh, large uh, cells of blastocystis. Uh, and the axenic cultivation uh, also can be used, especially uh, researchers, but uh, we talk about it is so difficult. Uh, Kevin uh, has some experiences, so uh, I tried many times, but it is uh, really, really difficult. But we need axenic cultures and axenic strains for special research. And uh, uh, I, uh, when uh, I identify blastocystis, I use uh, culture, uh, and uh, then uh, I get DNA extracts from these cultures uh, to uh, make uh, subtype analysis. And uh, when I compare microscopic examination and culture methods, Microscopic ex examinations uh, sensitivity is about uh, 54 percent, and according to another study, also we use microscopic methods and culture, and the, when we compare uh, culture and microscopic methods, uh, we uh, get uh, uh, high uh, blastocystis positive. And uh, according to another stain, uh, study, uh, also uh, microscopic methods have low sensitivity when compared uh, culture. And the, uh, another uh, study, uh, also microscopic uh, methods uh, uh, low, but between the uh, my studies, uh, you can see the different uh, percentage of the uh, uh, blastocystis presence, and also there are many literature about that. Uh, according to uh, Stansfold, uh, also when they compare the culture, and the, their sensitivity is high. Uh, when they compare the uh, another microscopic methods, and culture is uh, uh, also used uh, common, and the, there are many differences between the microscopic methods. Yes, and then uh, last uh, last four uh, ten years, uh, the molecular diagnosis became common. Uh, for uh, parasitology. For example, uh, uh, Poirier and uh, his friends published uh, this, uh, according to their publishing, they used uh, real-time PCR and cyber green. Uh, and uh, it sounds so uh, good because uh, you can uh, detect many different subtypes uh, when you make real-time PCR, uh, and when uh, they compare uh, the, uh, their methods, uh, the microscopy and uh, subtle culture, uh, they get high sensitivity, but uh, according to, um, there is no confirmation so much. I didn't find any publication so much uh, that uh, this method was used. And then 2012, uh, Stansfold and his uh, friends published a new uh, test, probe-based internal process controlled real-time PCR. And uh, according to this uh, study, only uh, two sample, uh, pos uh, culture positive sample, uh, negative by real-time PCR, but uh, 13 uh, sample, uh, they, uh, they, uh, these samples culture negative, and uh, according to real-time PCR, all these samples are positive. And uh, 
And uh, another tool for diagnosis, immunodiagnostic test. We talked a lot for this test. All these commercial tests especially uh, need more improvement. Uh, so we can use, but we can always compare uh, the other tests, especially real-time PCR. Like that, uh, ELISA tests have uh, uh, need to uh, improve for uh, its sensitivity and specificity. And uh, again, blast is blastocystis commensal or pathogen or op opportunistic agent. Uh, we don't know real which one is, but we know blastocystis is the most common gastrointestinal protozoan wo worldwide. And by the way, m according to many <laughs> authorization, blastocystis is not a global health problem. So, uh, because it also self-limited infection. Uh, and we don't know real morbidity and real mortality. So we need more researchers for this, uh, to uh, find all these questions. And we need also, when we use patient, uh, I, I am so sorry because I'm a clinical microbiologist, I uh, talk about only for uh, humans, but I need uh, your contributions at the end of the, my talk uh, for especially animal. <laughs> Uh, and um, uh, for research, uh, more questions according to the scope of research. Uh, and we use the same technique, uh, but for research is uh, also important to all uh, these, especially microscopic examination should be, uh, should be made uh, by uh, the same person if it is possible, because it is, uh, these microscopic methods also subjective methods. From uh, uh, sample, uh, when we uh, prepare smear from the sam uh, sample uh, taking and uh, make uh, staining methods or uh, evaluation, it's so uh, important. And also uh, culture can be used and the real time uh, should be used uh, if a laboratory has this test. Uh, culture and real time uh, should be used. Uh, but uh, we need subtype analysis in research. S because uh, we need more uh, epidemiological studies, because uh, subtype analysis can help to recognize routes of transmission and potential uh, source of specific ST in a precise area can be clarified and uh, to explain the interaction with symptomatology, we, t we need also subtype analysis. But there is no consensus for the best method to use ST's analysis. This made different results from same country and the different results from the uh, same city. And uh, until now, uh, two different methods is used commonly. One of them, we know uh, sequence, uh, specific uh, sequence tag sites primers. Uh, all these primers were developed by Hisao Yoshikawa. And another partial sequencing of SMOS unit RNA GN PCR amplicons. And uh, we use STS PCR characterization of blastocystis. And it has some advantages. For example, eliminates DNA sequencing, which is not easily available to every lab. So, in developing countries, can be used. And detection mixed subtypes, it is important advantage. But uh, with this approach, we can uh, have uh, seven primers, and if we uh, make seven uh, different PCR for each samples. And only no SDS uh, 
SDS can be detected, and neither or specificity of SDS has been identified, nor the range detectable SDS extended. High specificity, moderate sensitivity. SDS is imperfect used for non-human samples, and methods depends on interpretation because the, the interpretation of the size or specificity of bands. And it needs uh, more time, long time, and laborers. And it needs gel electrophoresis. And SCS primers may generally work better with DNAs extracted from blastocystis culture. So uh, before culture, and then DNA extraction, and then uh, SCS PCR, and then gel electrophoresis. Uh, but uh, 2016, Hisao Yoshikawa developed uh, different uh, SDS primers uh, nine, for nine subtypes. Uh, it can be used uh, and compa compare different methods. DNA samples extracted from blastocystis positive, uh, positive culture, and uh, I asked him also we can use direct is two samples. Uh, it is a simple, precise, and cost-effective method. Same amplification conditions for all primers. And then, uh, barcoding method. This method is commonly used uh, for research. Uh, analysis of consensus of DNA sequencing reflecting the uh, 600 bus pair, five prime of uh, small souvenir ribosomal DNA. And uh, advantages, uh, DNA extraction, we can uh, use uh, fecal samples, <coughs> fresh or frozen, and uh, it needs single round PCR amplification, uni and then uh, unidirectly DNA sequencing of partial uh, small subunit RNA, uh, RNA, the gene of the parasite, as the barcode region. And uh, the another avant advantage, online facility, <coughs> uh, MLCT database, effective, effortless, rapid analysis of sequencing of PCR products. And uh, automatically required uh, STS and subtype alleles and standardization of results reduce the risk of making erroneous subtype calls. And disadvantages only for uh, SDS analysis. So we cannot, uh, we should not use this method for diagnosis uh, to say positive or negative. Uh, so, uh, and preferential amplification of some SDS over the other uh, not detected mixed infection, and this method is not available in all lab because it needs sequencing, and relatively laborious and uh, expensive because uh, you need first PCR, uh, DNA extraction, PCR, and sequencing like that. And uh, for barcoding, uh, we can use two uh, primers. And the first one, blastocystis genus specific primer, and the other uh, broad specificity or karyote specific primer. For this reason, uh, we can get some uh, results according to fungal uh, DNA, especially in the absence of blastocystis DNA and in non human samples. It is also one of the reasons why this PCR should not be used diagnostically. And barcoding should be used only for molecular characterization of already known positive samples. So first, real-time PCR, uh, and then we can use barcoding. And uh, in the workshop, we study uh, with this uh, web page and this system. Uh, use, uh, uh, and another uh, important difficulty is the mixed infections. In my studies, I detected uh, mixed infections by using SDS primers, uh, 5 to 26%. So, 
uh, we need uh, more uh, accurate and reliable uh, tests to detect mixed infection. And Scanlan uh, and uh, her uh, friends uh, published and uh, developed uh, a new barcoding system, modified barcoding system. And it, uh, uh, but we needed nested PCR to detect mixed infection. Uh, and uh, first step, uh, we use uh, same primers, and second step, we use SD specific PCR. But we can uh, detect only uh, mixed infection if include SD1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, according to their studies, uh, in the mixed infections, uh, they uh, reported SD1 dominancy. Uh, so, uh, the right PCR technique and primer pairs essential to detect uh, all new SDS, and from animals and humans in different geographical sites. So, we need uh, more specific uh, primers for uh, this uh, study or tests. Uh, and uh, according to uh, laboratory uh, facilities, uh, blastocystis diagnosed with only uh, in some laboratories by using microscopy. Uh, and in some laboratories, the diagnosis can be done uh, microscopy and culture. And some laboratory, if have any chance to use uh, molecular uh, test, but the, uh, they need DNA extraction and they need PCR system. But uh, at that point, uh, DNA extraction is so important step because uh, in that step, some laboratory use manual system, some laboratory use automatic system. And there are many different uh, manual system and uh, the other system. And some laboratories use uh, real-time PCR and then characterization uh, with barcoding. And uh, uh, some laboratories use uh, also, uh, it is new technology, the nested modified barcoding system. And some laboratories maybe uh, in the future more uh, metagenomic analysis. And uh, we can see many different methods. For uh, DNA extraction, uh, we know uh, uh, it is common the DNA extraction system is uh, key again, uh, Minnesota toolkit. But in, uh, some researchers need more practical system. If they uh, organize uh, big studies and if they will be get many more samples. So uh, DNA uh, kit uh, for some laboratory uh, have no uh, financial support, so uh, they um, modify some uh, systems uh, manually, for example, sand method. Uh, and they, when they compare uh, this system, sand method, uh, and this same uh, sensitivity, and uh, we have uh, also uh, uh, a report, uh, 2011, uh, it was published. And when we used uh, CAMP DNA Stolmini kit, uh, we get uh, low sensitivity uh, when we compare the other uh, DNA extraction kit. So in some uh, studies, uh, the suggestion is using combination techniques. Yes, sometimes uh, it, we get, uh, when we use combination technique, high uh, percentages of positive. And also, uh, there are uh, new, some different kits, uh, commercial uh, available, but uh, we don't know uh, their sensitivity so much. For example, this kit uh, uses only di direct barcoding system. Uh, 
so barcoding system is not uh, conventional for the diagnosis. And uh, I saw this SIGIN system, uh, IVD uh, uh, certificate. Uh, there are, um, they, uh, this kit have many panels for gastrointestinal uh, infectious agents. I think it will be used for especially uh, fecal transplant donors. Maybe so uh, practical, but we don't know really sensitivity or specificity. And the, another system also. Uh, some researcher uh, try to evaluation uh, multiplex system different uh, for different uh, parasites, but uh, they use low number uh, sample, so uh, it needs more evaluation. And we talk about stool collection, storage collection, DNA extraction methods, PCR, and the correct PCR techniques and primer pairs. Uh, we need uh, all these uh, things uh, to uh, uh, for uh, explain or, or explore unidentified uh, subtypes and undiscovered subtypes are being missed. So diagnostic technique used for examining the infection rates is important variability that can influence the real prevalence. So thank you for your attention. And the, uh, and uh, my last picture from uh, Turkey. <laughs> this is Cappadocia province. It is great experience that I suggest you. Okay. I, have, I had an experience. It is perfect. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Funda, for providing this uh, very nice overview of diagnostic methods and all the challenges that we face, but also all the qualities that we do have now with all the, the things that we can do. And also thanks for um, highlighting the need for standardization uh, to uh, be able to obtain reliable data. I think we have questions, uh, uh, time for one or two questions or comments, so the floor is open. Yes, Rodolfo. Thank you so much, Funda, for your great Thank explanation. You. But uh, always a question arises, regarding the information that we can give uh, our physicians when you put the PCR, the molecular methods and direct methods. Uh, because we always say when you check a positive sample with a molecular method, you may talk about what happened because DNA could exist but the parasite could be eliminated or in very, very Low, low. low conditions. Mm -hmm. But when you see the fresh or the concentrate of the culture, you see it's alive mm -hmm. and maybe directly responsibly with the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And what about that DNA that would get in the gut and we detect it without any parasites yeah. available? Is it clear? Yes, yes. And the, uh, yes, we can detect DNA, but it is not alive, uh, Blastocystis. So it's so important, but uh, so uh, the, for the last slides, uh, I can agree. Uh, we use combination techniques, culture. We use always culture, and then if we have any chance to use real-time PCR, we uh, confirmation this uh, our uh, data, but we use. Uh, First, uh, first step after microscopic uh, examination should be culture for especially routine laboratories. That, that's what I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's important because physicians many times can misinterpret the, the result. Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I asked you. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions or comments? Yeah, we've got one here from Liliana.
Thank you so much for your nice talk. And also I learned very much for all of that. But what is very important for me, was very interesting, is about that we had to standardize something about the, the one technique. Because a problem that I face when I start studied the plasticity is that I use the barcode the, uh, to get my sequences. And when I get there, the sequences and I want to compare this with the others, with other countries, another, another uh, I research for other groups, I start to look that even, I ha even there are many uh, sequences from blastocystis, they are from different genes of different kind of methods. Mm -hmm. So, and that way I couldn't get so many is isolates mm -hmm. to get compared with my, with my isolates that I obtained from, the, from my for my study population. So I think that it's very important to unify some, um, some idea to how, what, what is the best way to study blastocystis in order to, to get a better research. Mm -hmm. So thank yes. you. I think there is one more question there. Yeah, the thank back. you. Um, thank you very much for, for all the data that you bring us. Um, I have a question about, um, it, it's more like, like a doubt, really. Uh, today and yesterday, uh, it was said that, that blastocystis is one of the easiest parasites or organisms to, uh, that can be cultured. And also, uh, during um, ex um, presentations, was said that or were told the difference in colonization or blastocystis colonizing the intestinal tract and, some, and also blastocystis that can be just passing through. Uh, for example, when culture blastocystis, a negative culture in a positive uh, sample can be a reflect of the, of the colonizing blastocystis and, the, and just the passing through blastocystis? Yes, maybe, uh, because uh, uh, sometimes uh, also, it's also it depends on the uh, which primers. If you use high specific primers, uh, maybe uh, your PCR positive, and then uh, maybe uh, if you are culture negative, so it can be uh, uh, comment that uh, it is colonization, but uh, we need uh, the uh, new test between uh, colonization or infection also, because maybe uh, patients have already blastocystis and they, he. Uh, has he, he, patient has a infection, and then uh, the blastocystis uh, disappear, uh, but the uh, active but uh, disruption before uh, leaving from the human, and then we can detect some DNAs. But uh, for this explanation, we need uh, use high uh, specific and uh, sensitive primers or test system. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Was that the last question? If so, I think we will terminate the session here and say thank you very much, Funda. You're welcome. Thank you.